Planning Board meeting, John Monroe, March 8th special meeting, come to order. First item is I will take a moment to review the minutes of the special meeting. This is Ann. I had just one uh, correction on page 2344, seven lines up from the bottom. I think the word renovation should be innovation. Section one of the law encourages, encourages innovation in residential development. This was uh, in connection with the discussion of the solar PUD. If not, I have a motion. I'll make a motion to accept the minutes. From the motion to, make to accept the minutes with one minor correction for the February meeting to the motion. We have a second. This is Ann. I'll second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Do we have two February meetings or just one? One February meeting, correct? Right? One. One. Okay. We're going to have uh, two in March, technically speaking. All those in favor, aye. 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 Approval. Abstention. Motion carried. Now, as usual, as I did last month, I want Fair. Uh, it's uh, SRA CJM for the uh, subdivision, formerly known as Arrowhead. Why do I keep losing this? Jim, this you Travis, there? can you hear me? Yep, Travis, we have you there, and I've already made you a co host. All right, I'm going to so, share my screen then, if that's okay. Yep. Yep, if you want to share your screen, please do. Good, I presume you can see that. Yep, I can see it just fine. All right. There's nobody else, All right, from, um, there's nobody else from your team or your applicant that I need to have on, correct? Just you? No, not for Along this one. Um, Joe, Joe Danable, I think, is, is yeah, I see him um, there representing for later, on. later on. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. No, right. Rich, Rich is not with us tonight, so. Okay. Um, Mar Mary Beth Slevin, um, I believe, is on the line. Um, uh, yeah, I'll unmute her. Give me a second. If you can find her. Yep. All right. Good evening, everyone. Travis Mitchell with Environmental Design Partnership, representing the applicant, SRH TJM LLC, and Richard Skirmerhorn in the uh, subdivisional lands <laughs> of SRH TJM. I'm gonna slip through some of these slides pretty quickly as you've seen many of them before with this application and the adjoining um, project location shown here. We've got um, Route 9 uh, to the west. The project site, it's a, uh, a, about a 23 and a half acre site um, highlighted by the red, um, the red boundary around, along the property there. On the uh, town zoning map, we're located on a split between the R1 and R2 zones. Close up of the uh, of the zoning map, roughly the property at lines outlined outlined as shown. Again, split between R1 and R2. The um, the subdivision layout remains the same as you um, you saw when we last presented. I think toward the end of December. Um, I've got it overlaid on Google Earth as we've done with with uh, this several times before. It does remain exactly as we have shown you previously, except that we've included the uh, the mail kiosk, which I I did mention when we presented the neighboring project, and we added um, the language that was requested about um, the ability to um, to do some type of future path on the HOA lands. We, as I mentioned last time, there was a collective traffic study done for this project and the neighboring two projects. 
Um, Graham and Peterson, on behalf of the town, reviewed that study and uh, provided their um, their concurrence with the findings, and that there there'll be no um, significant impact um, of the of the projects. Um, you've also seen this previously. This is our um, our cross easement um, for access and utility mapping, showing how each of the two um, neighboring projects can be constructed independently of each other, and obviously eventually um, with a with a joined road network. My uh, my approval process slide, as I mentioned, we were last before the board in in late. Uh, December here again tonight to review the preliminary plat. Um, we did submit detailed plans in, in December and again in February. I don't think this one got referred to the county. Jim can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we need to, to uh, if not, we need to get a county referral going um, and also um, um, make a, a uh, start a seeker um, action. Um, again, as with the neighboring property, I'd expect this will be an unlisted action. We did complete a full um, long form um, and would ask um, that you initiate coordinated review tonight. Um, as I mentioned, with a sign off from the town's traffic engineer last month, um, LeBerge was also asked to review um, the combined stormwater from the two neighboring projects. They provided their sign off last month. Um, we received some initial comments from the highway department, which there are nothing significant in there, and um, yet to receive comments from Jesse Fish on the water, but I wouldn't expect there'll be anything significant there as it's a pretty, pretty basic system. Um, that's, that's, that's all I have. I'd ask if the, if the board's ready that we consider a, a public hearing for, uh, for your normal April meeting. I think that would give us enough time for um, for the seeker coordinator review to come back and also the county referral. I think, um, Travis, yeah. we we actually, we started the um, the seeker action on this uh, in January, so. You, you could have, that's, that's my apologies if you did. I, I couldn't remember and I didn't have good notes on it. Yeah, we, we, we started that as well beyond the 30 days. We got one okay. comment letter back from DEC and they, they concurred with the uh, planning board acting as lead agent. Um, I have to check on the county referral. I'll check on that tomorrow. I think it was done, but I'm not certain. And the okay. public hearing for this is already set. It's set for next Monday. No, no, you're, um, yeah, you're, you're mixing up projects, mm -hmm. Jim. The public hearing for next Monday is the yeah. um, the Arrowhead subdivision. Oh, okay. All right, yeah, then this is the other, okay. Then, yeah, you're, you're yep. okay. Then, yeah, we do have to do the um, the seeker referral. We have to start from ground zero on this one. Yep. Yeah, I thought so, okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yep. So, county referral, seeker, and um, set the public hearing. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've got all the all the review um, portions back, and I think because of the odd stagger in the meetings, that we do have enough time to uh, to complete the 30-day coordinated review and the county referral if the board were inclined to set the public hearing. Okay. Yeah, uh, Travis. Uh, Travis, this is Ann Purdue. I've got a, a question. Uh, yep. Relative to the um, open space. Uh, what kind of provision are you uh, proposing to put in place to ensure that that open space is maintained and preserved as such? Yeah, so it'll be part of the homeowners association documents. It'll be owned by um, by the homeowners association. Will there be a um, clause in that deed that no further development is permissible? Sure, I would expect so. Yep. Should we be making note of that on the subdivision plat? Yes. That's fine. We, we can do that. So the homeowners association will be responsible for uh, not only owning it, but preserving and managing, maintaining that property. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think the other, the more important thing, Ann, is there can be no further development. And that should be on both the SRH side of the D yep. and the uh, Arrowhead Metal side. Does some of this open fine, space? Does some of this open space include stormwater management ponds? Yeah, so in Moreau, the, the town requires the homeowners association to own and maintain the, um, the stormwater management basin. So yes, they are, they are within the uh, homeowners association lands. So that's part of the open air, open space calculation. Um, yeah, I could double check it, but um, I, I'd have to double check to be sure, Ann. Yeah, I'm only asking because I think uh, one of the primary purposes of a cluster development is to ensure that there is open space. And I would think if you had to have stormwater management anyway, that that really wouldn't be open space in the sense you'd consider for this type of development. I think you're showing yeah, something I don't over remember six it. acres presently, but yep. I'm curious to how much of this is yep. really uh, a utility use and not a preservation. Mm -hmm. Sure, I, I can provide the exact accounting of the uh, of the open space and cluster um, uh, parameter compliance to Jim for his for his review for you. Okay, Thank ultimately you. to you, but I can push that over to Jim. Yep. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Hey, Travis, this is John Arnold. Um, Hi, John. I noticed that the centralized HOA um, between roads C and A that there's a large access area over on road A. This looks like a building lot that was left out. Is there any particular purpose for that being that wide? Mm, let me try and find a, a map that- uh, it's, it's actually right on work. road A, right across from the stormwater retention pools. Uh, here. Yes. Does that look right? Yeah. Yep, and, yep. and also up in here, yep. No, it, it's just, it, it's part of the, that natural drainage course that comes through here kind of flows through like this. So, okay. um, yeah, yep. So is that is that set up as like a swale or is it just, it just happens to be a area that'll help drain water to the retention pools? So there'll be, there'll be a swale um, through it, certainly not the entire width of the property of the open space rather, right. but the, uh, you know, the, the drainage course does flow through that area. Okay. Uh, to, are you planning on road names eventually here? Yeah, and I've actually this got them. The no, yeah. It have names. Yeah. yeah, it's just, it's odd the way okay. our meetings fell on this particular one. We've actually got all the, the uh, roads named and, you know, we, we missed the meeting. And then with your, with your staggered meeting here, we, we kind of, Right. Lost us a middle through the cracks, but yeah, okay. it's, 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 uh, the roads are named and, and, uh, I'll, I'll push that over to you with the next. Am I fine? It's the middle. And on that okay. score track, right. and my next hit, question um, is. Yeah. Mr. Mark. Yeah. Before I forget, we're going to need, um, address numbering, you know, mm -hmm. on, on both this yeah. arrowhead and, and this. You got it. Okay. So you got to get with uh, Travis. Um, my next question is. Uh, yep, understood. Travis, my next it's question is: This is not hooking up this. Um, this is not hooking up the sewer, right? That's uh, not not at, at the this moment. time, John. That's right. Okay, so when I'm looking at this map that I have, the paper map, I'm showing. Um, white block looks like the building, and then there's like a, a hash mark thing between, behind every one of them. Is that location mm -hmm. of septic, or is that the back part of the roof? Nope. So that's likely septic. what you're looking at is is the um, you know, sizing for a septic system. That's correct. Okay, so it's just showing that there's room to put it in there, and uh, that's right. Okay, and the last question is: as I've been bugging you with this project about access to the park, we're going to actually be able to finalize that discussion with the project just south of this this evening. Um, on the previous development or subdivision plan that we talked about last meeting, 
Um, there was an access way from road A yep. over to the HOA to get to mm -hmm. that. Yep. I don't see it on the map I'm looking at now. Is that on yep. the previous map, but it hasn't shown up on this? Yeah, so again, with the carryover, so this this map represents just this portion, and the the the, the lines that you see right. on the neighboring parcel are just an older um, rendition of it. So, yes, we've actually, if so I So they weren't updated you, for that? No, and it doesn't show here oh, it's either. it's okay. As long they, as it's there, I just... Yeah, it's there. That's yep. okay. No, it's there for sure. Yep. So... I was just checking to make sure because there's one thing that showed up on this one is there's some type of an access drive to the stormwater retention pond. Yep. But it's listed Correct. as being an access road for that. I wanted to make sure that wasn't now our access to the no. HOA to get to the park. Okay. No, good. we we good. just as you had asked that, last that time, we stormwater we moved management. Apart. Right, because that stormwater management will be fenced, right? You know, it can be if needed. It's something that I'm gonna work on with Paul Joseph. He asked that same question. Um, we have as good a soils as we get here. There's no sign of groundwater and um, we're not required to fence them and we prefer not to, but um, it's certainly okay. if, if, if Paul right. wants them fenced, we'll fence them. Yep. You don't expect there to ever be water, you know, a foot or two deep in it then? I do not. And, you know, what I'd suggest is that we can um, set up a provision in the homeowners association language so that if in the event, you know, we, we're we found to be wrong down the road that the HOA fences them. But I'd prefer not to have the fencing there. And I think the neighborhood would as well if uh, okay. if it's not required. Okay. All right. That's all I have at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, John. Hey, Travis, my favorite. Oh, wait, I did have one. Travis, how are you? Looking at your site detail, um, you got the water services, you're running two inch copper water services, or is it just a standard drawing here? And yeah, no, they won't be two inch copper. They'll be, they'll be, you know, three quarter inch. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that. It won't be two inch copper. Yeah, three quarter on the short side, one inch on the long side. Mm hmm Typically. I think that's what it is. Yeah. I just I didn't know if you noticed there or not, but I saw it there. And then again, of course, you know how I feel about the sewer. I think that the, the sewer should go in. So I just want to make a note of that for the um the record. Okay. Understood. Appreciate it. Thank hey, you. Travis, this is Ann Purdue again. And I I concur with Mike's view that that uh, using the sewer system would be preferable. Um and I you mentioned the issue is cost. Are we are you talking about the real property tax or the usage fee or both? No, well, it's really the the what I guess would be the real property tax, the ad valorem tax that um, that pays for the debt service um, over the next thirty years. It's just it's not um, from what I've seen so far, and and at some point I imagine we'll get some updated numbers. But from what I've seen so far, it, it's not something that's affordable for a single family home. And so you're not, this property is not currently within the, the sewer district, which is subject to the tax. That's correct. Okay. Travis, can I ask you a question on this? How sure. does, how does, um, and you, you've got a whole lot of experience with this, how does a health department look at that when, when there's a, a sewer main going by the property? Don't they, don't they usually prefer the property to be hooked up to it? I mean, we'd all prefer it to be hooked up to it, um, but there is no regulation that I'm aware of that requires it. Mike, it's my understanding that that's a matter of a local law and it's one that we just don't have yet. Some communities do have that where if you're within a certain district of either a water or sewer district, mm -hmm. you have to hook on, but we don't have that here yet. Okay, I, thank you. And Travis, just a quick question is something I, I missed on my notes here. This being a housing development, it's just going to have a street sign out front, right? You're not planning on sign called Arrowhead Meadows or... Yeah, no, that's a very good question, John. And I've actually um, worked with the Michaels Group, who um, we expect to be building these as they did with the Winterberry project down the road. And we they have developed a uh, similar sign that um, we'll be pushing to you in the next set of drawings to what um, 
what is down the road at, at um, the Winterberry project. Okay, because I hadn't seen any sign locations um, or things. I didn't know. Yep. No, it, it's not in the package that you have right now, but it will be um, part of the next submittal for your review. Okay. Travis, one more thing is I see you got PVC pipe in here. We're not using ductile. And that's a Jesse call I understand, but. Yeah, I mean, ultimately it's up to Jesse. Um, we prefer to use PVC and I think he has allowed it um, previously, but ultimately that'll be Jesse's call. If he wants ductile, we'll use ductile. Correct. Yeah, just, just to run him by him, I didn't know. Thank you. Yep, yep, no problem, thanks. And Travis, this is Ann. Uh, what, what is the, what would you say the break point is in terms of affordable cost of participating in the public sewer? Yeah, that's a good question, Ann. And the challenge that, that we have right now, and, and I, I, you know, I've been told, and we all, we've been told on, on occasions that, um, that, that the cost as it was laid out in 2017, um, which was somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 um, is what it works out to be for an average single family home in this um, in, in this type of subdivision. So that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,500 to 3,000 a year for 30 years, which that is just not, it, it, it's not even close to affordable. So and we think what, you know, what is affordable? Um, in the, you know, the New York State um, Comptroller sets a threshold of affordability above which it requires their review and approval for this type of project. And the last I knew that number was somewhere around $675 a year. So, you know, the, pretty much the state sets a threshold on what they determine, um, you know, what they consider affordable. Um, and I would, I would look for somewhere in that neighborhood as a, as a starting point. Graham, so the cost, um, much of a difference between putting in the, um, the infrastructure for a sewer system comparison with putting in septic systems is, are the, are the costs pretty close? Is, well, is you know, it, typically, it, yeah, it's a good question, Mike. So typically, you know, a, a sewer system in this type of soil it is going to cost more than a septic system, no matter what, because the septic system here, you have the best soil that, that you can have for a septic. But if, if it were just the infrastructure cost itself, then, then you know, you, you, the benefit of the sewer outweighs it. The challenge here is that we're paying you know, potentially not only the infrastructure within this project, but the infrastructure to get the sewer, you know, all the way to exit 17 on Route 9. And it just, it, it supporting that additional infrastructure, which is necessary to get the sewer there, it's just not, it, it isn't something that's, that's affordable for a single family home. The, the commercial properties are along Route 9 are a different story because, you know, in that area, you really need the sewer in order to reach that maximum development potential. Here, you know, a septic system as, you know, example through all Moreau, um, through the residential development that's happened there so far, a septic system can work, um, can and does uh, work effectively and efficiently. So that's really the, the issue that we've got. Thank you. Welcome. Or any further questions? Well, I got, I got one more. Have we heard anything from our schools or anything? Somebody put out a note, didn't we? To notify our schools that we heard because we've got quite a cluster of peaks. Right. I, I, I notified them for the first one that's coming up next week um, in regards to the seeker, and I did not hear anything back from them. I think somewhere, somebody, I mean, this happens every time we, we adopt something. We don't hear back from, from that. I think, do we have a liaison from our town to the school? And somebody, we need to have something on the record that says the school is either okay with this or not okay I with can, this. I can check with them. I have because, no problem checking Because they're, the in, they're in a position right now, I don't mean to get off the beat here, but they're in a position right now where we may be bringing another school to our district. And, and we should we should make sure that they know that there's 140 homes at least coming into our town. 
before we get too far ahead of you. I would like to hear a definite answer, either yay or nay. From them. That's one of the reasons why we included the school district in our notification procedure. Historically, they have, have ignored it. Yeah, and, but, and that's but I will, I will, I will make that an answer. I will call tomorrow directly. I appreciate that. Thank you. I just, yeah. I think it's important. I mean, your point's well taken. It's kind of extenuating the circumstances here when we have, you know, uh, three subdivisions, four subdivisions coming in in this proximity in this volume. Right. It, right. It's kind of exceptional. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out tomorrow. I'll call the um, district superintendent. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I'll try and get an. I'll try and get word before the first public hearing next week. On the Arrowhead side, yeah, yeah, I, th I just think it's good, good business. Well, again, Travis, you managed to confuse me, which is not difficult. I go here two at once. I'm not sure. Have we declared? Seeker for Arrowhead. We, we have for Arrowhead, but not for this one. But he is requesting that we do it for this one. And we do, we, we, that's where I got confused. We, we have a public hearing set for Arrowhead next week. We do not for this one. I just wrote down that this was Arrowhead. <laughs> really got to name this uh, pretty soon here, Travis. This SRH thing's not working. Don't we have to wait for the county to get back to us with, or let their time lapse before we make a determination? No. No, the, the, the county's not involved in that decision. And, and, and you know, we're not actually making a determination on Seeker, just declaring yourselves lead agency and initiating oh. coordinated review. Okay, yep. I understand. Sorry, I misunderstood, Peter. Yeah, no, no problem. No problem. Thank you. So you're looking for a motion for us to... Uh, declare lead agency and list this as an unlisted action or just the agent? That's what we're looking for. All right, so I make a motion that we declare lead agency on this and that we list this as an unlisted action. It's John Arnold making the motion. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, Mr. Chairman, for the coordinated review, we will be reaching out to DEC, DOH, uh, DOT, the Attorney General's Office, uh, the co uh, County uh, Planning and DPW, and the School District. We got them all. Motion has been made to declare SRHTJM subdivision as an unlisted action and for the Planning Board of the Town of Aurora to assume the role of lead agency for that environmental review. To the motion, do I have a second? This is oh, Meredith. This is Anne, I second. Oh, Meredith, you go ahead. <laughs> Trish, this is Meredith, I'll make a second. Tough fight. Mm -hmm. Motion's been made and seconded to declare SRHTJM as an unlisted action and for the planning board of town of Aurora to assume the role of lead agency. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, this one is not really too controversial. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We got there. Is there anything else you'd like to consider or do? Do you think you have enough information to go to the public hearing? Uh, 
Yeah, I, th I think we do. If you feel that you do, then we will need a motion to reflect and such. Um, I'll make a motion that we schedule a public hearing for the, the SRH TJM subdivision on, I don't have my calendar, April 19th. 19th at uh, 7.05. Yeah, we already have one slot filled with the uh, PUD. Yeah. Yeah. That was 7.05. Motion has been made to schedule a public hearing for SRHTJM subdivision for April 19th to the motion. Do I have a second? This is Meredith, I'll make the second. Motion has been made and seconded to schedule a public hearing for SRHTJM subdivision for April 19th. Further discussion? You need to list the time. Seven, do we need to list the time? 7.05. Okay. Since there's no further discussion, this is not too controversial. All those in favor, aye. 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 I oppose. Abstention. Motion carries. Okay, and Travis, I would just remind you that you have to put up the uh, public hearing sign 10 days prior on the property. That's right. So don't forget that by April 9th. Will do. Mr. Mitchell, Turner Bell Spare Plate, do you have any further questions of us? I do not. Thank you all for your time. We'll see you next week. Well, thank, you. thank you. Next item I have an agenda for this evening is Sarone for Jacoby Farm North. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hold on here, I'm getting caught up with you here. What, what's the next one, Mr. Chairman? Jacoby Farm North. Okay. Let me get, um, Hello? Hello, Joe. Jim, how you doing? Good, how are you? Hey, not, not, not bad. Um, you can be uh, hold on here, I'm uh, getting caught up with you here. Just hold on a second. Okay. Um, I'm going to make you a uh, co-host because you, you do have a screen you want to share? Yes, I do. All right. Okay. Says you have disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah, I'm making you a co-host to, to do it that way. Okay. So you should be getting that capability any time now. I got it. Here we go. Okay. I believe everybody sees the uh, cover slide. Yep. And I've got Gianni Simone and Anthony Cerrone on. I got them uh, unmuted as well. Um, excellent. I think that's everybody. Uh, Johnny, Anthony, anybody else that you need unmuted for this conversation? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that if they need it. Um, I am uh, I'm ready to go if everybody else is ready. Those are sorry. Okay, we now have Carla on this as well. Okay. Hello, Carla. Hello, everyone. 
Okay, go ahead, Joe. Okay, um, good evening, Joe Danable with the Environmental Design Partnership here on behalf of Cerrone Builders and their application for a 23 lot subdivision to be known as Jacoby Farms. Uh, we last presented this project in December of 2020 as a concept application, uh, at which time we had 27 lots uh, and some additional land. Uh, um, just so everyone's clear, we've uh, taken away and we are not combining any land from the north with the south. We're strictly only dealing with the lands on the north, <clears throat> north side of uh, Rec Road. <clears throat> Um, so slide is north. Uh, what we are looking at uh, is uh, highlighted in yellow. That is the Jacoby Farm north. Uh, the land immediately north of that up in here is the Arrowhead and SHR TJM subdivision that you were just speaking about. Uh, Rec Road here, Gansvort Road, Bluebird Road in that location. Um, we are at 12.74 acre parcel. We are located in the R2 zone, which permits single family residential as a use. As we work through the density computations, which have been uh, provided to the town at the concept, we are permitted a density of 23 lots on the north side of the property. Uh, again, here's just a uh, existing conditions. We're dealing with uh, existing farm fields, abandoned pasture fields. I think everybody in the town has gone to the park uh, at least once and has a, a general idea and understanding of the existing conditions on that property. Again, vacant uh, pasture land, uh, the primary access road to the Harry Bitar Park. Um, and just so everyone's aware, there is additional land on the south side of the road, a separate tax parcel um, that is known as Jacoby Farm South. And we will be coming in with uh, applications for that in the upcoming months. <clears throat> Um, so here's the uh, general overview of the layout. Uh, again, we have 23 lots. We've uh, created a plan very similar to what was reviewed during the concept. We're providing uh, three new town roads, road A, B, and C, uh, that provides access to all 23 of the single family lots. No individual driveway will be connected to Lenox Boulevard or, or Rec Road. Um, there's about 1,500 linear feet of new town road. Um, our proposed building setbacks as part of the cluster are a 10-foot rear, 25-foot front yard, and a 7.5-foot side yard. Stormwater will be managed on site in a series of uh, infiltration basins and underground stormwater practices. Uh, water will be connected to the municipal water supply for the town of Moreau. Um, sanitary provisions, individual septic systems on individual uh, lots. <clears throat> uh, as we are looking at the uh, plan, you see the roads. This is the house, typical house driveway. And then in the rear of every yard is a septic system outlined, identifying that we have plenty of, of room to do that. Um, this heavy line here is the limits of the open space uh, different than the uh, previous applications we we're proposing to have uh, deed restricted privately owned open space so um, there will not be any HOA lands associated uh, with this application. Um, Stormwater is being managed uh, in these areas here and here we are working with the town on stormwater management and how we're going to handle it over on road C uh, we've had uh, um, uh, had a meeting with the highway department, uh, uh, Jim Martin, and, and uh, there are some uh, uh, minor changes in the plans that we are looking to to move forward and finalize that stormwater uh, in accordance. But again, I think that was a very productive meeting. Uh, one of the things that came out of that meeting is we were proposing Road A and Road B to be one-way uh, streets that are 16 feet wide. Um, as a result of that meeting, those streets will be widened to 22 feet and be um, full access uh, travel in both directions. We're proposing street trees along the uh, uh, side of the road uh, to create a street, streetscape consistent with the park-like setting to which this project leads to. 
<clears throat> this is the uh, overall grading and utility plan showing stormwater management systems, septic systems, the lots, the grading associated with it, um, and, and everything of that nature. Uh, ultimately, this project will be reviewed by the, uh, the town's reviewing engineer. I don't recall seeing a letter from them, so I'm not sure that they have reviewed it yet. Um, certainly, we think that is uh, uh, going to be appropriate here in the upcoming months to get a review by the town engineer. Um, just for an overall view, this is Jacoby Farms North, uh, the uh, intended layout for Jacoby Farms South. Uh, you see that all of the uh, roadways align with each other. Uh, we're not putting any private driveways out onto the main road, um, <clears throat> and we're providing access to a, a potential future uh, development in the south if it is to ever uh, come forward. Uh, we have reviewed a letter provided by Greenman Peterson. A uh, couple of the items in there, while the overall combined traffic study shows that this project combined with the other projects in the area will not have any um, significant or uh, degradation of the level of service uh, within the area. Um, they were concerned with the amount of curb cuts we we're proposing on Rec Road. Um, that is somewhat contrary to what we heard in our previous meeting. The uh, uh, planning board in our December meeting looked very favorable upon this layout in comparison to some other alternatives. Um, so that, that is a, an element we will have to get worked out uh, with this board, with Greenman Peterson, uh, the highway uh, superintendent certainly <clears throat> um, uh, preferred th this alternative and not having a bunch of driveways coming out onto uh, Lenox Road. <clears throat> um, you know, with that, I can certainly um, try and answer any of the questions the board may have. Uh, we are looking to um, uh, initiate the uh, coordinated review of this project if that is what this uh, board deems appropriate. We are, we do believe we are an unlisted action. So we would like to do that and we'd like to get set up for a public hearing as soon as possible to continue review of this project. Thank you. Uh, the one question I have, Joe, you know, from an administrative point of view is I'm not sure that we ever received an uh, allocation for escrow um, for the uh, payment of um, the uh, stormwater review. Okay, I guess uh, get us what that uh, that would be, and we will certainly get. It's a, it, 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 it's, it's a twenty-five hundred dollar amount, and as soon as we receive the money, uh, we set up the account, and then we send the uh, the uh, stormwater plan off for review to the engineer. Okay, we will make sure that gets to the town as soon as possible. Thanks, and we'll, we'll start the review right away. Now you declared this, to, uh, I think this is an R2 zone, and I kind of agree with you. So you're coming in as a cluster development? Correct. Have you done your due diligence in your arithmetic to uh, demonstrate that the number of lots uh, would fall in with acceptable in that scenario? Yes, the, um, the site statistics on the cover sheet of the drawings have the density computations. Uh, and show that we have an allowable density of 23 uh, single family lots on the 12.74 acres. Oops, I just like to disregard first pages, I guess. Board, any further questions? I guess this is a with a water line. Are we going to have a dead end water line on this street? Mike Shaver, for the record. Okay. There is a um, meeting scheduled next week to address the water connection into the park. Okay. So that we can have a, have a continuous loop. Okay. And, and then also on your, on your site details, you, you also have a two inch copper water service that you're going to be running into all these houses. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, again, uh, similar to the previous project, that is going to be either a three quarter inch or one inch. Service lateral. We'll get okay, that. So that be okay. And then, um, is there any thought about putting sewer in here, municipal sewer? Well, um, right now, this this property is a good two, three thousand feet away from any sewer lines. 
Um, certainly if it was extended to the doorstep and the uh, sewer was at an appropriate fee, it would be something we would consider. Um, however, it being so far away from our property, uh, the only possible option we have is septic systems. It is fine, but if, if, it, if it was brought closer to you, you, you would consider it, correct? If, it is, if it's brought closer to us and the uh, fees for the, um, we'll say the taxes are brought down into a, uh, an appropriate level, we would consider it. Um, certainly the other item is the, the timing associated with that. This subdivision could certainly be under construction this fall, uh, making sure that we have the, 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 the availability of sewer with that coincides with the timing of construction would be very critical as well. Okay, okay. All right, yeah, that's, that's fair enough. I, uh, I, just, I just think again, you know, we're putting in a lot of homes and I'm, I'm big on the sewer thing. I think it should be all, all hooked up to the sewer. So um, if it's available, we can, we can talk about it as we go along. But thank you for your time. Or any further questions? Uh, this is Ann Purdue. Um, rel relative to the storm management areas, who's responsible for those? The stormwater management areas will be maintained by the uh, homeowners association. And, they just said it wasn't and, and how much how much acreage here is going to be restricted to no further development? There, there is, we are dedicating a uh, small area of land to the town for an entrance to the park. Uh, that is located here. Uh, I don't have the exact number, but all the land that's outside of the lots in this dashed area is all going to be deed restricted. I can certainly provide a, an exact number uh, in the following meeting. Yeah, Joe, can you do that calculation and provide it? Certainly. Joe, I have one other question. What are you going to do with that compost pile that's there? It's going to make some beautiful topsoil for all our homes. <laughs> are you just going to spread it out? or? Um, we're going to have to probably relocate some of it off site. Um, um, it's not going to be suitable for fill underneath the roads, underneath the houses, underneath the septic right. homes. Um, we're use as much as we can on site, and some of it's going to have to be trucked off. Are there are there any concerns? I think we need to get a hold of uh, the fire on this because that thing is probably hotter than hot inside. No. Once, once we start taking it apart, maybe we should notify fire before we do that. No. Uh, I, I mean. Yeah, I mean, if that is what the town wants, we can certainly do that. I, I don't necessarily, that, that, that pile's been there for quite a few years. I'm sure it's fairly decomposed at this point in time. If there was a fire hazard, it probably already is past that point. Um, but if, 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 it, if, it is a, if it is a safety concern or there is an issue, certainly the fire department will be contacted. We, uh... You think it is or you know that it is? Joe, can I talk? This is Johnny Simone. Yes, Johnny, go ahead. Uh, gentlemen, Freddie, my excavator was over there when we were digging uh, deep holes for perk test and engineering. He actually broke up the pile a little bit and there was no heat or anything coming out of the pile. We just wanted to separate it to see what we have. Some is topsoil, some is natural waste, like we said, you know, leaves, debris, wood chips that will be hauling off the site. So there is no concern of that. How far did he go into it, do you know? All, all the way, he pretty much went down 10, 10 feet, almost down to ground level, because he was trying to see what was topsoil and what was, had to be held off the site. To try to start separating it, because that is something we want to start getting in the process to get ready for fall construction. The further you get in, the that's all. The further you get in, the further you, the further you get into that pile, the further you're going to get away from oxygen, which is going to lower the heat anyway. So it shouldn't be a huge issue on the interior temps. This is this is John Arnold. I have a couple of questions. 
Um, you mentioned something about in negotiating with the town, something about a park access. Was that in the northeast corner? Um, I don't know that we are talking about any park access. The meeting we're having um, in, in a couple of weeks is dealing with uh, uh, water line extensions, road improvements, street trees, street lighting, uh, things of that nature. Okay, the reason I bring this up is this was originally brought to us with an HOA. There were lands on the back edge behind all the lots that were considered part of an HOA. You've changed that now and made it um, deed restricted uh, for development in the back, which is which handles the idea of maintaining some semblance of open space, but it's not exactly open space, right? I mean, this isn't public or even for the people of the development to use, it's people own this and their homeowners are covering their acreage all the way to the boundaries, correct? Um, that is correct. It's, it's deed restricted in that it'll never be cleared of trees or further cleared of trees, uh, um, but it, it, it is privately open, privately owned deed restricted open space. Um, but there is some of but there is some of this that's homeowner association, correct or no? Um, there is no homeowners association land proposed. So we have we have a cluster development with no um, no actual open space provided. Um, I, I, there's no HOA open space. There certainly is open space. Okay. So I must be missing the point. So when you're saying open space, you're just saying that there's nothing to be developed in there. You're not saying that it's accessible open space. It's just undeveloped areas. It is uh, undeveloped open space, correct. Okay, all right. I, I'm, I'm just trying to hash this out and figure this out. I've been trying with, with your development and with the one next door to gain an access for walking from these developments to the park to try and keep kids from being out on Route 32 or Bluebird Road in order to get to the park entrance, okay? The development north of you has no direct access to the park. It has no direct connection to the park boundaries, okay? So when you presented this earlier, there was an HOA, and I had suggested at that time that it'd be nice to have access across the corner of what's now Lot 17, to provide access for not only this development, but also for that other development to get to the park. Uh, at this point, it looks like there's no way to do that now because I don't imagine that Lot 17 wants to take on the responsibility in their homeowner's policy to cover that liability in that corner. Is that pretty good a presumption on my part? So um, it, it, I, I guess I just wanna reflect a little differently um, in December, and I'm looking at the plans from December right now, and I can bring them up on the screen. Does that show up on your screens? Yep. Um, in December, when we presented it, this was presented as privately owned deed restricted open space. There was never any HOA lands proposed um, at the development or as part okay. of the development in December, and we remain consistent with that um, in, in uh, uh, currently. Okay. The, 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 print, the print you bring up, Joe, shows, like in lot 17, shows the line stopping right there. So if you, let's zoom in on it a little bit. Uh, it, it's, nope. here is the lot line for lot 21. Okay. This line here is nearly identical to what we're showing today over here. That is the limits of the deed restricted open space. Um, we've always proposed this to be privately owned land. It was never proposed to be HOA lands. All right, because I'm I'm a big proponent of what John what John brought up. Um, yeah, we've been pushing hard with with you guys on the other one to provide access through theirs to this one to get into the park. Um, so, you know, a small revision to lot 17 that could be possible across that corner. So our, one of our biggest concerns about providing trail access through that area is we're now introducing at least 84 residential lots access through the rear yard of lot 17 and lot 16. Um, one of the biggest complaints 
um, not only from this builder, but all the builders I work with in, 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 the, in the area, in the region, is having people walking through essentially your backyard creates a security risk when your children are out in their backyard playing and, and doing uh, what kids do in the backyard. If we start introducing and bringing a bunch of you know, 84 homes that could be you know, 160, 320 people that could come through that trail system at any time. Um, so it is a security risk and we're not comfortable providing um, trail access immediately behind our lots. We think it would significantly devalue those lots. Okay, so just if you don't mind my interrupting for just a minute, a solution to 17, lot 17 homeowner not having to cover the liability of that would be maybe that a portion of that land wide enough for a trail could be deeded over to the town park Correct. to provide access to both developments. With that in mind, I, I get your idea of them not wanting people walking behind them, but it's important to note that lot 16 to lot 23 already had the park in their backyard. Right. There's going to be people walking back there anyways, right? Yeah, so we're already taking that into consideration in our in, in our um, um, uh, pro forma for the project and that those lots are already going to be devalued and now we're going to um, de be devaluing another lot. Uh, no, you aren't lot because is... lots that, no, excuse me, sir. Let me, let me just clear this up. You won't be devaluing that lot any further because that one also is already bordering on the park. Uh, we'll be devaluing it because now we're introducing a trail that is promoting people to walk through that. Um, behind 16 and 17, currently it is just a wooded area. Yes, people can walk through there, but there is not a trail that would promote people walking. Um, yeah, right. I think I think it's done. You just you deed it to the town and put some fences up. I mean, I, I think it's I think it's a good idea, and there are ways to mitigate the uh, the downsides. And it may never get used. I mean, you don't know, but the idea is to try and, I mean, if, if you're okay with the kids from the development that you're proposing going out on Rec Park Road to get to the park, that's fine. Okay, I, I'm just trying to find a way that we can provide safe access to the park. I'm not even sure that the park is okay with putting an entrance there. I haven't even proposed it to them. I've just been trying to put the pieces together so it could be possible. Um, so it, it's it's something we we uh, will we'll consider. I know we are meeting with the with the town next week. Um, that that conversation is going to be trying to determine how much additional infrastructure and upgrades that this site can provide to the town. Um, certainly, one of the things that has come up in the past is that we have a unique parcel, um, an asset having direct access from the main the main main boulevard uh, into the park um, and that, that that's something that no other community in the in the area has um, you know pr providing that additional access certainly I, I, I'd say uh, provides additional um, assets to uh, other communities which may hinder this this uh, community and it may not make it as valuable and um, have enough uh, um, revenue in order to be able to help the town and give them some of the elements that they're asking for with the additional infrastructure. So um, we'll consider it something we'll bring up with our meeting uh, with the town next week. Yeah, I'm right, favorite so again. The other... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. I'm sorry. I, I just had a couple more. Oh, oh, this is the first. This is the first time I've seen a development where they propose using the cul-de-sacs and the inside of loop roads as stormwater management areas. Is that something that, that our engineers should look into? I've never seen this before. So we did have a meeting with Paul Joseph last week. Um, certainly the stormwater management area that's in the center of the cul-de-sac, uh, we are going to remove and we're, we're looking at different alternatives for that right now. Um, the other areas are simply shallow grass depressions. Uh, they are going to look as if they are mowed grass and, and they will be usable most times of the year um, for residents of the community to go out. So there's going to be an easement over the, the, the center of those um, islands and, and eye, eyebrows that the um, HOA will maintain that area and they'll, and they'll be a hold harmless clauses set up with the town 
uh, for the use of those areas. Um, I've done this in a few other communities within Saratoga County, and it actually works out quite well. So I guess that answers my next question. You're, you're calling them eyebrows. At the things that are listed as stormwater management that look like ditches, those aren't ditches then. Those are actual micro pools for stormwater management. Is that the idea? So if we're looking at this area here and this um, area here, that is- No, I was, no, I was talking about along the roads. Um, over here. Yes, and along the park road itself, along Lennox Boulevard. Right, and, and that, that's something we are working with the town on right now. We're looking at alternative designs, possibly uh, uh, bringing that to the south side of the road and creating just a standard stormwater management area that everyone's accustomed to. Um, um, okay, well, before you do that, is it, are these two separate developments? Yes. Okay, so once again, we're talking about handling stormwater for one development on another or another parcel. Right. Okay. Is that cool? I, I, I just to answer your question about the engineer review, John. Uh, like I said, we haven't started that yet. They haven't paid the fee for the review. As soon as that escrow account is set up, the review will be started. Okay. All right. Now you said you've had discussions with Paul the Highway? Yes. We were in uh, Paul's office in the highway garage last Thursday, I believe it was. Okay. And he's against stormwater management in the cul-de-sacs? Um, just the one cul-de-sac. This one here, he doesn't believe it's enough space. Uh, he wants to be able to do some um, um, uh, snow maintenance in that area. So we are, yeah. um, we, we are looking at other alternatives. Between Thursday and today, we didn't have time to do an updated map. Um, and, and revise that, but certainly in the uh, following um, meeting in April, we're going to have that updated and revised with an appropriate solution. I guess that's what my concern was, is it seems like all of your stormwater is right where all the snow would be plowed. They stopped by the storm in the middle of the call of the sacks. Yeah. Well, so if they get along the road, it's going to pick it up too. I'm not saying I don't like it. I think it's a, a nice use of those inner areas. It's just I'm wondering if this is going to be an issue if there's a, a heavy snow year and a spring thaw. Yeah, and, and, and certainly that's something we can review with um, the, the engineer. I know, again, we talked with the, the highway superintendent. Uh, um, he didn't like the small cul-de-sac using that one, but the other two he was okay with. Okay. Joe, Joe, has there been any progress on the water district to, if you're an out-of-district user or any resolution to that because it's conflicting information? Yeah, uh, the county apparently says you are and our mapping says you are not in the district. So I can actually handle that. that. I, I yep, can actually, I, sorry, um, if that's okay, I can, I can actually handle that. Um, so I did look into that. I was at the town hall for about three hours today trying to go through all this stuff. And um, the, the property is not within either Water District 4 or Water District 1. It borders on both. What you're looking at when, when you folks, uh, the applicant says that it's, um, the county says it's in a district, what you're looking at are the assessment records um, for some reason, the assessment record says you're in a district, but you're not technically in a district in the town and the map governs. So what you would have to do is just connect to either Water District 1 or Water District 4, and, and then you would have to be an out-of-district user. You can still connect to it because you're adjacent to both, so you can still get municipal water if we have the capacity, and I think that's something we can talk about when we have our meeting um, in the next couple of weeks, but just to make everybody clear, that's where things stand with the water district. Um, the other thing I wanted to, Joe, and maybe I, I don't understand, you have said there is no HOA, and then you say there is an HOA for stormwater, but then you say there's not an HOA, and then there is an HOA. So is there or is there not an HOA for the stormwater? Like who is going to take that over? Yeah, just to clarify that, there is going to be an HOA that will be responsible for the maintenance of the stormwater management area that are located on town land. 
there's not going to be any HOA owned lands. Okay. All right. I, I think the board was a little confused and I thought I heard some of the board muttering about that. So I wanted to verify that. Okay. Carla, what do you favor? You said they're not in the water district? They are not in any water district. They are adjacent on either side. The, the park side is water district four and um, the, uh, you know, Gansvert Road side, that is water district one, one of the extensions of water district one. Okay, so, so they have to do a district extension? They would have to do a district uh, extension. No, 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 they would not have to do a district extension. They could do an out of district user, but they could, they could so they have, have an out of district contract. agreement. So they could do a contract for the town. They could, yep, yep. Okay. And that's something we're going to talk district. about because there may be capacity concerns that we just have to look into. But that, that's something we're going to talk about, you know, um, when we meet when, in the next week or two, I think. Okay, thank you. Joe. Joe, yeah. Joe, can we just go back to that compost pile for one second, please? Sure. Look, looking at it from a public safety issue, um, once we start taking that thing apart, we actually do look it in there. We, we, we could have some problems. So, so once you start taking it apart, and I know Freddie's there. I happen to know Freddie very well. He's an excellent contractor. Could he just notify the county that, that they're going to take that thing apart? And maybe have fire come over and do some random inspections, but to talk to them before we get ourselves into a bind over there. There's there's a school there's there's a school there, and, and there's there's quite a few residential homes. And I hate to see that thing get going and get a lot of smoke and and create some things in the public. So I think I think just as um, make a note for Freddie to do a simple phone call to the county and um, let them know what's going on up here. Just a it's just a courtesy thing and a, and a public safety thing. So if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, no, notifying the, the, the county or the fire district? Fire district. Um, you can notify the county and they, 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 could, um, they could get a hold of the fire chief and, and, and then the uh, department could go from there. It's um, again, you know, with the school and everything being there, I, I hate to see we get a good smoky thing going there and get everybody in trouble. So. I'll, I'll say we, 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 we'll, we'll, we will um, agree to notify the appropriate entities uh, at the time and we'll, we'll make sure that, that's that would be great. Thank, Thank you. That. And, uh, this is John Arnold, Jim and Carla, the two of you can fight for, for uh, ownership of this, but. Could somebody check with the town to see if the town would even be interested or willing to put an entry to the park there at that corner? I just I'll realized that. Up. I mean, I just realized I've been bugging both developers about this, and I don't even know if the park wants it. They may not want access in that corner. So um, I'm looking at I'm looking at the drawing right now, and it looks like a wooded area with some baseball fields and things like that. Yeah, this is Meredith. I was I was thinking, I know it's in the village, but off of Tamarack, which was Michael's group, um, off of Woodcrest, they have a connection to the bikeway and all that trail system. And it's quite yes. nice. I'm sure the village must own it. I'm looking at the mapping, but it's just a gravel, crushed gravel path that cuts off Tamarack, goes into the bike system. Um, my kids and I use it quite a bit. It looks like the neighbor has a fence. Um, the house is listed at 433 on Zillow. Um, so I think it's doing pretty well. Um, so I think if, if, you know, if the conversations with the town go forward, maybe we use that as, you know, see how the village worked it out in that development. Because yeah. I mean, that lot 17 is way back to that back corner. I mean, it's well away from the house. It's a very large lot. So there's certainly, if the, if a portion of it was used for a trail through there, it could be um, shielded, it could be fenced, whatever. Um, it wouldn't be, you know, too obstructive, but to the same degree, I hate to put a whole lot of pressure on the developers, either one of them anymore, unless the town says, yeah, we wouldn't mind having an entrance there. It may not be anything anybody even wants at the park. I don't know. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to spitball ways to make sure that if these houses end up with a bunch of kids in them, they aren't riding their bikes on Route 9 and 32, if we can help it. Um, or not Route 9, excuse me, 32 and uh, Bluebird Road, if we can help it. And if we can't, then we can't, you know, that's, is what it is. Mr. Martin? 
Has this been uh, sent to our engineers? No. No comment? Not yet. No, we're still waiting for the escrow funds. Okay. And I see a lot of concerns that I have. Maybe I'm an idiot, I don't know. But uh, I see a proliferation of stormwater areas that are going to get filled. And they're going to get relocated if possible. I think we need comments from our engineer and consultant before we keep going any further with this. Because we've got a long, long time. If you look at my front yard, snow clouds, come on. Well, the, the thing is, we don't have an up to date stormwater plan from the applicants. I mean, this was just uh, known last week that they're changing their, their approach. So I don't know where you're at with your redesign, Joe, but. You know, we're going to need a revised slip and all that that reflects whatever the plan is for stormwater. Yeah, and we're, we're certainly aware of that. Again, they're just uh, between what when we found out that this was an issue with the town at the, the meeting on Thursday and today, there was not time to do any of that work. Certainly, that'll be submitted for the next meeting. And certainly, that's what we would ask that the town engineer reviews. Our engineer treatments. So, so our engineer this. Oh yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. It's not there yet. Okay. Another just just another question quick. You have in the back of almost every lot here, I think it is every lot, a dashed oval shaped feature. What is that? So that, that is a, a shallow grass depression um, that that would be managing any of the runoff that would come off the rear roofs of the houses. Um, it basically just temporarily attenuates that storm water. Uh, and slows down the, the, the flow of stormwater uh, heading off site. So that's also part of the stormwater management. Correct. That's part of the stormwater management system. And everything we're doing here is to kind of eliminate. Is that, is that also HOA? No, those are individual homeowner responsibilities. So what, what, I guess, is that going to be in the deed that these, those particular areas cannot be touched? Yeah, they, either because they'll they're, be, um, uh, it'll be in the, I think in the deed, uh, there'll be restrictions associated with them, yes. Because, I mean, they're not in the do not touch area of the lots that you've designated. They're inside the lot areas, that dotted line, that's the um, untouched area. That's why I was asking is, so basically a, a good portion of the stormwater for this project is being managed by individual homeowners. Um, I would not say a good portion. It's a re relatively minor portion. It's just the rear roofs of the houses. All okay. of the, the front roofs and the driveways and the roads are all being managed in larger um, ponds or areas, larger areas. Okay. If that is to the way it actually ends up, then that will, each one will be need, need to be annotated on the plans. The town cannot enforce a deed restriction or anything like that. The only thing the town can enforce and follow is if it's part of the approved subdivision mapping. So if you're going to do that, it has to be on here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not 100 percent following that comment, but we do have them shown and we will be calling them out as a restricted area on the approved subdivision plans. So how do they actually function, Joe? They, they're, they are a, a sloped depression in the, in the yard. Uh, it, it's a shallow grass depression, if you will, a, a six inch deep area that the roof runoff comes up roof hits the ground runs across the ground and is ultimately collected in these um, small depressions and then it infiltrates into the ground so what if property owner number two comes along he's mowing his grass one day and says huh i got this i got this depression in my backyard i don't like and he goes down to lowe's and he gets seven bags of topsoil and fills that in because he doesn't like walking down in that hole every time he mows his yard. What's going to happen then? So he would be illegally filling that um, in a deed restricted area 
Um, and, and it could be enforceable that he has to remove it. Enforceable by whom? Not by the town. Uh, I thought you were just saying that anything that's represented on the subdivision plan can be enforced by the town. If you if you so annotate that on the plan, yes. Boy. I don't care if you like it or not. How are you going to enforce something like that? I, I guess from my standpoint, Joe, I, I would encourage if there's an alternative method that you investigate that. Yeah, certainly we can look at it again. It's, it's uh, if, if, if we think about it logically, the water coming off the roof is probably never even going to make it to those depressions because it'll infiltrate through the ground. However, the, the, the way in which the manual reads and the way we have to design this to show it in our calculations, there needs to be some level of attenuation on off the rear of those roofs. And I mean, the other option is opening up a swale that drains behind all of the properties and collects and is discharged, which I think is more obtrusive than these small little depressions in each yard. So what if you were to move those depressions into the area that's already annotated for not being touched? Well, the, the, the purpose of that open space area is to have it as open space. Um, the deed, re deed restrictions associated with that open space is, is, is no infrastructure, nothing that needs to be maintained. Um, okay. We gen would need annual maintenance. Okay. Or any further questions? Okay, we've heard in the beginning that the applicant has that we scheduled a public hearing. That of course is up to the board. My take is it's nowhere near ready. Yeah, I question to answer and information needs to be gathered before the plan. But I am one member of seven. It's up to the board. The other thing I would just suggest to staff is we have a relatively full public hearing slate given the content of the applications on April 19th already. We have two scheduled and it's going to be for Arrowhead and um, the PUD. And we, at this point, we this hasn't even gone to our engineer to look at it and we're not sure that it's going to go. There actually have, have come out or surfaced this evening changes that have to be made before it even goes to our engineer. As far as what came out of talks with um, DPW and from this meeting this evening. I agree. I mean, do well, we think there's any- Applicants, you have any further questions of us? No, I think, I think um... We do need to come back with the updated stormwater plans and get some engineering comments. Um, uh, I guess I would just ask that this uh, certainly, uh, if we could start the process, uh, if there is going to be a coordinated review, um, that we, we can uh, start that process to help start expediting this. That we certainly can do. Or what is your pleasure? Type one, type two, unlisted. We can see about the water difference. If they're going to even give them water. Because if they don't give them water, then it could be something totally different. I think we need to wait. I guess we don't have Without that. municipal Thank water, you. right? Without municipal water, this could change everything. Yeah. They're not in the district. We don't know if they're going to be allowed in the district. No, no, they're, not not the district. Sure. they're not going to give them water. But as far as seekers concerned, is it type one, type two, or unlisted? I don't think it's unlisted. No. Do I have a motion of some sort? Before the applicant falls asleep? <laughs> Oh, 
unless there's something unless there's something I'm missing here, I'll make a motion that we we um ask we listed as lead agency on seeker. List this yeah. as an unlisted action. Motion thank you. Motion's been made to declare Jacoby Farms North as an unlisted action as far as seeker is concerned. To the motion, do I have a second? This is Meredith, I'll make a second. Motion has been made and seconded to declare the six, a unlisted action for Jacoby Farms North as far as seeker is concerned. Any further discussion? So you're taking lead agent status and declaring it, yes. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Board, do you want to put yourself into the position of being the lead agency for this review? Thank you. And the full motion. Sorry, I thought I did that with the last motion. So yeah, I, thought, <laughs> I thought we did too. I think I listed. It was a motion for both declaring unlisted and to set lead agency. It was a dual yes, motion. I did. So that one's already gone through. Okay. My error. I will shut my big mouth. No, no, please I'm don't be. Do uh, I'm going to do the, the same six DEC, DOA, DOT, school, county, and the AG. Yes. Okay. Anything further, board? That I can mess up. <laughs> if not, turn about square play. Africa, do you have any questions of us? No, I, I, um, I, I think I'm all set on this application. Uh, I do have one question, if I can. Yeah. We, uh, this is Johnny Simone. Jim, we bring a check to the town of Moreau tomorrow for twenty-five hundred dollars. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Make okay. it payable to the town, and we'll establish the escrow account and get the review on the engineer started. Okay. I we do apologize. We uh, this is the first time we heard of it, so I will get that to uh, the town tomorrow. Very good. And if, if I may, I just like to remind Jim. I'd like somebody to ask the town if they would even entertain the idea of having access to the park from that back corner. I have it down on my notes. Comes in front of us. Okay. It's just because there's no sense. If they don't want it, there's no sense going any further, pushing any more on it. Okay. So. Yep. All righty. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Jim. I have to apologize to you if I mispronounce your name. It's not intentional. Gaetano or something like that? Gaetano. Gaetano. Hold on, I got to catch up with you. Hey, Jim, uh, this is Joe Danville. Are you there? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, are we going to be discussing the other um, um, uh, application, the Vintengale application at the end of the meeting? Yes, we are. Okay, I'll stay around. So you have the honor and privilege of hanging around to the end. Wonderful. I'll try and stay awake. <laughs> <laughs> That's a chore. We have one of the next ones. Uh, let me see here. Is Bill on? Bill Rourke? Bill, are you there? Bill? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Bill, you're a technological wizard. I'm telling you, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Pen and paper works better. Okay. Yes, we have uh, the agent is at the time, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Tell us a story. Okay, we're, um, we're doing the Robin Raw Ginatino subdivision. They've, um, I believe it's the last lot they're going to uh, develop. There's two other houses 
that have been approved. This is lot number two. It's just slightly up, it's 42,000 square feet just under, under an acre. They're proposing, it has 155 feet of road frontage directly onto the road. It's being cut out of a uh, 12 acre parcel. I don't believe, I, I, may, I shouldn't say this, but I don't believe they're uh, going to be developing any more lots. I'm not sure of that. But this is um, just a one lot subdivision. And just if, if the board recalls, I think this was last on in maybe November, and there were some problems with the, um, the mapping that has since been corrected. But the reason why this is before you as a two-lot subdivision is they already did their one administrative two-lot, and now any other subdivision has to come before the board in a seven-year period, so that's why this is here. And I think this is a compliance situation now as lot one does have two points of frontage, if you know, it has 20 feet and then 40.13 feet on Fort Edward Road um, with one existing house on it, so that's lot one. And then this lot two would be uh, a new compliant lot with, um, with a proposed residence on it. So, uh, that's why this is here and it was looked at once and we had to get some um, clarifications done on the mapping and I think that uh, was in place so uh, this is back. Yes. Okay. More questions? What's your take, Board? I don't. I don't have a lot of questions. Up, but it's pretty straightforward. I think so. It is. Yeah, uh, other than the seven-year, you know, the seven-year thing, this would would have been administrative. Correct. It, is, it still does require a public hearing. We have to. Right. Go through that. This is Anna. Just a quick question. Um, I guess the balance is lot one. It's access between uh, the Tikio. I may not be pronouncing that incorrectly. Lot and the lot of the Fowlers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you look closely, and there's a forty point one three foot dimension there. Yeah. Yeah. Right I just want to make sure. I'm And then as a technical matter, it does have another area of frontage of 20 feet on um, Fort Edward Road. See that, okay. So what, is, what, is, the, so what is the plan for the balance of the land? I mean, right now you have none? No, it has a house on it. Um, yeah, but it's still quite a bit of acreage. Well, there's a wetland on the back part of it. And it, uh, if you notice the buffer line, I see it. It's I pretty really consumed doubt, by that. I doubt if they're going to be developing that. Okay. What? No, does lot one also go down the north side of lot two? Is that what that data line's indicating? I did notice a, this is Meredith, on the seeker form, number 14, uh, typical habitat types that occur on, they checked urban. Um, that's incorrect. Yeah. 
Yeah, Bill, you, we'll, we'll correct the, um, you should correct that response to 14. Yeah, probably it's, um, would be. You certainly have wetland, so that's one item. Excuse me? Yeah, I said you certainly have wetland. Yes, yes, I do, yep. And then I think it's more appropriately termed suburban than right. Uh, urban. All right, and probably forested too. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That should be corrected. Okay, what else do you want to do? Hey, Bill. This is yeah. John Arnold. Yeah. Um, you've been out on this site. It was questioned earlier whether lot one could be further subdivided. Um, that area down on the south edge of it that's accessed by that 40 foot or whatever strip from Fort Edward Road. Right. Is that is that also wet there or is that is there an area there enough that that could be um, used for another lot? Um. I won't hold you to it. I'm just curious. Uh, I don't have feet on the ground there. So I, I have no indication that, the, that they're going to develop anymore. Um, I guess it could be. Okay. It's, um, it's in the upland inclusion area. Okay. It probably could be. I wouldn't suggest it. Right. Okay. I was just curious. They have not told me. So going back to the lot that lot number two that we're looking at subdividing, um, is there a reason why it's proposed to have the house that far from the road? Is there some type of a, a land? Well, um, um, there's see that's that dry ditch across the front of the property. Right, About right. 18 inch pipe in there. It's it's nicer in the back. And okay, have all built in the back. I think it's a lot nicer. Okay, so it's a, it's a choice. It isn't a requirement. Yeah. It isn't correct. Okay. Correct. Right. All right. Nope. Okay. So we're looking at a potential public hearing on this. This is a, but this doesn't fall under our normal subdivision. Um, site plan requirements, right? Correct. Okay. Because I'm, I'm noting that we don't have any um, any terrain lines or anything like that on it. Um, we have we have uh, landmark designations and wetland designations, but we don't have topo lines or anything like that. But we don't need that for this smaller thing, right? We typically do not for two lots. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm thinking, okay. Okay, board. Would you see your hand out? Type one, type two, unlisted. What's your pleasure? Two, isn't it, Peter? Mm -hmm. I would say my personal opinion is yes, but that doesn't mean the board's going to agree with me. If we have an opinion, we can take it as a form of a motion. I think the subdivision, this is Ann, I think the subdivision action itself is, is maybe um, an unlisted. Type two, I think it's the construction or expansion of, of a residence as opposed to the subdivision. But, you know, Carla may have a different view. No, we can, we can do it as an unlisted. 
Well, the whole thing is in here before us. So that's however many acres. They're looking at creating one, but this one lot that's true. is an action of the total area. Unless it has been in here as a subdivision previously, and I don't believe this has. Then we should probably change number 12 on our um, subdivision application that lists this as the last of a four lot residential subdivision. I don't know if we can word that differently because this is a two lot subdivision then that's in front of us, not the last of a four lot residential subdivision. It has to be considered if two, what they're calling now two, is part of the total right. parcel, then we have two lot subdivision, yes. Yeah, so that should be changed. Sorry, what should we change, John? Well, on number 12 of the... Um, Seeker? Subdivision application, number 12, it says the oh, proposed yes. development plan, briefly describe it, and it says last of a four-lot subdivision. Sorry about that. I was looking at the seeker application. That, has, that doesn't fit. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so now we can go back to your type one definition again. So Sorry. Do, that's okay. What are we going to declare this? What's your pleasure? Well, Is it unlisted? I mean, be a two subdivision, wouldn't it? Give me one second. <laughs> I, I don't see subdivision listed as a type two, so I'm assuming it's an unlisted action. This is Ann. <laughs> Is that in the form of a motion? Sure. If I can help, this should be listed as an unlisted action. Thank you, Carla. I, I make a motion that we determine this as an unlisted action. Motion has been made to declare the two lot subdivision. And again, I apologize, Regina. Regina. Uh -huh. I'm so close. As a and unlisted action to the motion. Do I have a second? I can second that. Was that John? Yes. Yeah. Yes, motion it was. I'm sorry. Second. That's okay. Motion been made and seconded to declare this as a un an unlisted action. All those bouncing too controversial. All those people, right? I, I, Abstentions? Do you like it? Motion's been made and seconded. And I have all our discussion. And our vote has made this unanimous. What else would you like to do more? Do we have everything we need to do a public hearing? Well, that is a question that uh, I would ask the board members to feel that you have enough information. Meredith, I feel like we do. I think we do too. Pretty straightforward. So I will make a motion to set the public hearing. made a motion to set it. Meredith. I'll second. Meredith. Mike seconds. We need to prepare a public hearing uh, for when? 
April 19th, was it? We have three that night, but. Yeah, th this shouldn't be too bad, though. I think we can do this. Yeah, I think we can put this one in with those. Motion been made for a public hearing for April 19th, and I will go on the minutes and say 715. To the motion, we have a second. I'll second it. Yeah. Motion's been made and second to defer the discussion. And that I don't think is too controversial. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Bill, are you still there? Yes. Yes. Don't forget to put your sign up 10 days prior. Um, this being an unlisted action, we're still going for preliminary and final approval, correct? You may be able to if you request that at the, uh, after the uh, motion on the preliminary hearing, you may? Yes, I'd like to do that and possibly uh, the final also, possibly the same. same yeah. You can do it, you can always make a request. Okay. It'll depend on how controversial. What was that? I, I, what I was going to say is that'll depend on how controversial it turns out at the public hearing, right? Right. <laughs> Turn about fair play. Do you have any further questions of us? Nothing. No, I'm all set. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Now, Mr. Martin, did I understand that uh, there was a pending request from Mr. Vittengill? Yeah, it might be good to do that before you get into the solar law so yeah. they don't have to hang around. Let me see if I can. Joe, are you still there? You want to sleep? Yep. I'm here. Yep. Tell us the story. Um, can I share my screen? Please. Uh, yeah, let me, um, where'd you go here? Let me, get, let me get back to you. Hold on a second. There you go. Should be able to do it now. Okay. Um, so we had previously got final approval, I think in January, for a two lot subdivision, very similar to what we see here. Lot one was the existing auto dealership. Uh, the division line came up through here. Lot two was on this side and we had an easement for future access. Um, since that time, the, uh, the owner, Mr. Vittengale, has um, gotten an offer on the land for a uh, 200 by 333 foot lot. They don't need all of lot number two. Um, so what we're looking to do is still keep it at a two lot subdivision. Uh, lot two would be highlighted in orange. Blue is the access easement. And then the remaining lands would be lot one. Um, so just a, it's a minor change in that lot one is now on both sides of the easement uh, and lot two is, has gotten smaller. Board, questions? So we have to take that building down before we get anything? Yeah, so it's, it still would be a non-conforming building, the uh, old car wash. So I was going to ask, it's still there, right? <laughs> yeah, so there, as far as I know. Yeah, we, we haven't ripped so, it down uh, yet. <laughs> Thank well, you. Down well, the, the condition of the approval was that that had to come down before the class was got final signature. Correct. And I would still recommend that to be the case. Okay. We would agree to that. The thing I think it's important to do here is, 
until such time that road is built, you really got to put the the blue lines, the roadway, out of your mind. That doesn't exist yet. Right. This is still just a, simply a two lot subdivision with an easement going through it for now. So the access will still be out of the nine. Hopefully. Well, I mean, it's only an easement. There's not a road there, then we can't have an access without the road running. Right. Right. Without the reservation for And he's doing it. So Ever. I just thought this was a, a change that was significant enough to bring it back to the board so you're aware and, and approve the amendment rather than doing it administratively. <clears throat> uh, this is Ann. How much acreage is um, on that other side of the easement, the, the property that used to be all of lot two? Um, so lot two was 3.2 acres and lot one was 2.8 acres. Um, I don't have the revised areas on here, but you're probably um, 300 by 200 is probably going to be more like 1.6 acres. So you probably have about 1.6 added to the 2.8. So you're probably going to have like 4.4 as lot one and um, about 1.6 and lot two. But what portion of that lot one is on the other side of the access road? Uh, about 1.6 acres. You're talking about the lot in the back that's being proposed at this moment that, that yep. could be there. That would be 1.6. Right, but it's it's okay. really a 4.4-acre um, lot. That no, I understand that. Yeah. Well, I see where John's going with his thinking that in the event that the road is built, that would be a compliant lot. Yes. It'd be a third lot. Yeah, at the time the road gets built, there might be a further subdivision. Is there any right. reason we don't call it a, a lot three now? Because it'd be, it would be landlocked and a non-compliant lot. Yeah. That makes sense. I got you. Okay. But in the event this road is ever built, it's still a buildable lot because it has sufficient acreage. Yes. And sufficient frontage on what would be a new public right of way. With all due respect, that was your question, not mine. <laughs> That was a good question. Okay. So this lot two that's being created then, if, if this other road isn't built, it will be accessing or having its access weight onto Route 9 itself. Correct. And it would be up to the user to get a uh, DOT permit for that access. Yeah, no, oh yeah, yeah, and that would be understandable. And, and, and just be aware, anything that occurs on lot one is gonna be in front of this board for site plan review and approval. Right, of course. And it'd be through that process likely that the, uh, the access permit is dealt with. Yep. Anything that's done on lot two. Yep. Yeah. Okay. How far does the um, existing drive go presently between the two lots? Um, I think we're pavement up to about this point here. Okay. Yeah, at, at site plan, even for lot two, if that was the first thing to come in, you'd want to start planning for the eventuality of that access road so the drive would come through that area where the access road is shown. Right. <clears throat> hey, Jim. It, yeah. it, it, how would that look? Would they have to get an easement from lot one then to use that? Until the road yes. is built? Okay. Yes. Now, you know, you're, you're going through the same thing right now with that um, BKM proposal there on, on Old Saratoga Road. Of course, yeah. Yep. It's the same type of thing. Yep, okay. Board, any further questions? Nope. 
I, I think a, a simple amendment or a simple res uh, resolution approving the amendment as shown would be sufficient. What's your pleasure, Mark? So that amendment would only change the lot line adjustment, right? I mean, uh, basically, yeah. instead of the lot line following that easement, it would be split now to the new lot too. Um, that wouldn't Correct. change any of the other any of the other contingencies or any of the other restrictions from the previous subdivision or uh, subdivision approval. All right, including the ones that say that that we don't sign mylars until that building's removed. Correct. Yes. Okay. And, and if you want to put in your approving amendment, something to that effect, that would be fine. I don't know if it's necessary, if it doesn't, if it's already on the original site plan and it hasn't changed because of that. But if you want to yeah. it'd be kind of redundant, I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, much pleasure, Mark. I can make a motion to make a lot line adjustment from the previously approved um, site plan to the new lot two designated um, plan that we have in front of us here. Okay. Motion has been made to approve the lot line adjustment. And I'm going to do a little bit of interceding here. Do we see this uh, headed as Auto World or as Mr. Vinton? No. Auto World. It was Auto referred to as Auto World's uh, three lots of the or two lots of the Well, that line adjustment to Auto World subdivision. To the motion, do I have a second? Second. Second. Like, motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, would you call the roll, please? Trisha's there. We'll try. I am there. here. I'm here. Yes, I just need to. I just want to make sure the you are unmuted. I can't Hi, see who that is, though, in the room. Is that Mr. Seabolt? That's correct. And is he voting tonight? I don't believe he is. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, <laughs> let's see what order I want to do this in. Ms. Perdue. Yes. Mr. Arnold. Yes. Mr. Bergman. Yes. Mrs. Matias. Yes. Mr. Shaver. Yes. And Chairman. Hi. I have six in the affirmative. Is that correct, Madam? Yeah, Mr. Adam does vote because uh, Gary's not here. Right. Yes. Right. All right, That's Mr. Right. Siebel. <laughs> that was an I. Got it. <laughs> so I have six in the house. <laughs> Can't count. That's six. <laughs> <laughs> They've said that was six. Motion carries. Six. My shoes on. I couldn't say. One, two, three, four, six. Thank you, That's our humor for the evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, board, for the consideration. Good night, y'all. Yep. Good night, night. y'all. Next item I have is the discussion on the draft solar law. Who wants to kick it off? <laughs> Carla, did you want to do anything to introduce this or? I can if you want me to. Um, sure. I, okay. You've looked at this more recently than I have, so. I've looked at this way too much is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Over the past six months. Um, what, what you have before you is the draft solar law that was worked on quite extensively by the town board over a number of meetings and workshops. Um, they went through line by line, um, working with the model law. They had some pretty intense discussions. Um, what you have before you is what they wanted to send to the two boards and to NYSERDA to review, um, to get further comments and then have a full, a fully vetted draft to go out to the public to hear the public's concerns. Um, we know the public is very interested in this um, and we don't wanna diminish the public's input, but we wanted to be able to have a cohesive document um, to be presented to the public. 
So um, the document you have in front of you has been vetted through the zoning board last week or two weeks ago. I can't honestly remember when they met. Um, and um, they have some suggestions. Um, I attended a meeting with NYSERDA and a couple of the town board members um, oh, a few weeks ago where NYSERDA and their clean energy siting team went through uh, with us for um, over an hour and a half and gave us some suggestions, gave us some thoughts. Obviously they, you know, they're just, you know, helping us out here. They are in the process of working with Pace University Law School to revamp the, the model law. So this actually was very fortuitous in that the town of Moreau's law is being looked at with NYSERDA. Obviously NYSERDA cannot tell the town what to do. It's the town board's um, role in enacting the law, but uh, NYSERDA has been good to work with and their clean energy siting team in particular. So um, you folks are, I, I don't wanna say the last line of defense at this point, but you're the last folks I'm waiting to hear from with respect to this law. I know that I have received some comments and I've had some back and forth with a, a few members of the board. So I guess, I, I don't know, Jim, I don't know how you ran this with the zoning board last week. I was unable to attend that meeting. So perhaps you can go through it the same way you did it with the zoning board, if that seemed to work for you. Well, what, what we did is we, we and I talked to the board, obviously it's your meeting, but um, that evening we went through just member by member and got their individual comments. Um, I took some notes um, and then they also had the option of, uh, if they wanted to send along an email with their individual thoughts, that's certainly permissible, and I, I just forwarded it on to the town board. I think you all saw that. Uh, so Gary Engel did, did take advantage of that. He had his individual markup that he provided, and then I did the summary points from the uh, members based upon my note from what they said, and I also provided them the opportunity to, to supplement that, that, that further if they wanted to, and I haven't heard anything yet. But, um, so I, I, that seemed to work, but it's up to you guys, however you want to do it. Um, but we went through person by person. I know, I, my, my biggest question, and, and from my start, is if that's okay, okay with anybody. Um, and it's, I guess, Carla, um, is there anything in this? I, I did not see anything, I could have not read it, but, but the disposal of these solar panels. Is there anything that we can say they cannot be disposed of in the town of Morrow. I go back to the GE site where things got buried, didn't know about it and that kind of stuff. And not knowing anything what's inside these solar panels is um, in 20 years from now, they need to go someplace. Um, if they get broke on site, what, what is the cleanup detail that could protect the town on this? Um, I think the way that that would work is through the decommissioning plan. You would have to, um, they would have to put together the decommissioning plan and explain how they would remove all of their documents, all of, um, not documents, I'm sorry, all of their panels. And that is something that the town could require that they cannot be disposed of in the town. But um, I, you know, I'll, I don't, that has not come up yet. So I'll, I'm taking notes and I'll see if we can incorporate that in. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, Carla. Yes. Well, Jim, I'm gonna I'm gonna I, I did have an uh, an exchange with Carla over a couple of things, but I'm gonna want to make sure we put them into our minutes here. So I'll go through them again, anyways. Um, one of them is under the definition of a ground-mounted solar array. The very last phrase in that definition is is for on-site use. Yeah, that's gonna be changed, John. That, that, okay. Yep, All right. So I wanted to make sure. Off. Yep. Okay. All right, because. Really, ground mount is about the type of of um, structure, not necessarily its its generating use. Um, another thing is is on. I think in the law it mentions forty percent coverage. Um, that the panels on a, a tier three um, in the R five can't be more than forty percent of the site coverage. What I'd like to know is I, I honestly consider that to be a a pretty large percentage. Myself personally, if this is really about you know 
trying to allow access but not have it be the primary use in the ag zone or in the R5. Um, but I would wonder how you would enforce that. I mean, like if, if somebody owns 100 acres and they want to put 40%, which would be 40 of those acres, is there some kind of restriction on the other 60 of what can be done with it? Well, I think that's that's going to be addressed through the application process because the other thing I understood, Carla, that's 40% of the land after prime farmland is deducted, correct? Well, that's what's being... Right now, the law says that prime farmland cannot be used. Okay. So All right. Right that now, first. I don't know as if that's going to remain, but that is what is being proposed. And I would, if I, oh. if I may, since that's been brought up, I would like to say that I like the designation or the way that it was listed in the law for protecting that land. I know there's been comments from other people on the zoning board and, and on the town board that it appears sometimes that their biggest concern is whether people are going to be able to see this from their back window. Um, as a farmer in the town of Moreau, I can tell you right now that there isn't an acre of farmland in the town of Moreau that isn't valuable. That isn't, if it's good farmland, if it's prime farmland, historically good farmland, there is a market for it and there is a use for it right now. So anything we can do to make sure that if these solar panels get put in, they don't get planted on the best farmland in the town, it's a smart move. Um, I know everybody just, keeps... What is the definition of prime land? Well, it does, I was going to clarify that. My understanding is that there is a standard that is meant to qualify as prime farmland. Yes. And that is a mappable standard. It is. Well, actually, words, somebody's got... Go ahead. It's actually um, in a map already. I mean, we get, we get that That's information I mean. from, the, from the county. So if somebody's got 100 acres and they have 50 of this prime farmland, then that gets mapped and that area is not to have a solar panel. So that person is automatically dealing with then 40% of 50 acres. And that's okay. mapped in the county right now? On not the state, the state has that in their clearinghouse of, of mapping, the digital mapping, uh -huh. there's a layer that is prime farm. Okay. But it's important to note that not all of the prime farmland is mapped, but it can be. Okay, so, so should, it, should, should it be? Well, I, it can be as you go along. I mean, I'm going to say this, uh, probably all of the farm active farmland that's prime farmland is already mapped. Well, John, and, and again, in answer to the original question, how is this going to work, is if somebody applies to have a solar array on their farm, it's going to come in for site plan review like anything else, and that's going to be a standard to meet. In the application process, do you have prime farmland? Whether you're regardless whether it's from okay. the state mapping that's available or right. if that person ha hasn't done that, they're going to need to quantify that in order to answer that question. Now, the, 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 once that's mapped, right. Once uh, that's mapped, then you're going to work outside of that area. The wording that I saw listed prime farmland, it also saw, said farmland of historic significance or whatever. I mean, it did a very nice right. job of, of including everything. So I was good with that. But my question to you then, Jim, is, okay, let's say there's our, our 100 acre farm, 50 of its prime farmland. We have another 50. We can cover 40% with panels. That's 20 acres. Okay. Is that other 30 acres now designated as undevelopable because of that? Or I, I, I no. guess... I mean, Okay. No, so it, just for the purposes of purposes of locating a solar array on that site, it would okay. be limited to that 20 acres. Okay. All right. I wanted to make sure of that. All right. So if somebody wanted to do that and then take the other 30 acres and put houses on it, they could. Correct. Okay. Is, or or an allowed yes, an allowed use. Do, do they have to be so far away from the residential area though? Well, you would have to, uh, um, in the law itself, just like with any other application that become, comes before you, there's going to be setback requirements, there's going to be um, you know, visual requirements, all of that is in there. And that's why you folks, you know, this is going to be on you. You know, you, you, want, you guys are going to be the ones that do the, the um, hard work, because when the applicant comes to you, they're going to have to meet everything. 
and you're going to have to right. go through this. And so that's why if you think there's something that you want to see in this law that's not there, let us know because, you know, you're the ones that are making the sausage, so to speak. Well, if, if we put a residential area in, I, I, you know, I wouldn't want them real close to a residential area, right? Is there, again, we don't know, do these put off anything? You know, like if you live too close to an electrical line, they say it's not good for you. I, I, I'm not an expert on this. Is, is this something that we don't know what these things put out? I, and is there future harm down the road to a, a, a residential area or too close to a school or? I have not heard of any. No. Any health issues being um, or deriving from proximity to a solar. I don't, I'm not, I have not heard of this. Is there any place we could go to get that answer? Not I would think I sort of know that. Yeah. They Nicer did not bring that up. I've, this is Meredith. I've been in wireless telecommunications and now I'm in energy. And no, usually that argument doesn't hold anything. Um, your home microwave puts out a lot more than any of these things. Right. So, and, the, and you know, the other thing I would like to bring up is, is we keep, like I said, it was, it was from what I've read in the paper and read from the minutes from the meetings, there was always a concern that of these things being visible. And, and uh, Mike just said the same thing. We, you know, maybe we want to make sure these can't be cited too close to a housing development. And I almost have to say, if we're going to call these things community solar arrays, um, I almost wonder that they shouldn't be set near housing developments where they can help offset the electrical use instead of, um, it, we seem to want to just stuff, throw it out into the farm area, you know, where there's open space and we can just leave it out there and it won't affect a lot of people. Um, I mean, I realize that these things generate, they hook up to the electrical grid and they can go anywhere. So I'm not saying that I think it has to be directly connected to a house. Um, uh, I just don't know. Just let me, just, just let me correct. Uh, clarify a couple of things. Sure. First of all, the reason why the ag land in Moreau is coming under such interest from these providers is it just so happens that our ag land has a couple of prime transmission lines running through it. One of the things that's a primary consideration for commercial solar is proximity to the transmission line. If you're too far away, it doesn't become feasible. So three things. That's, what's, that's what's really putting the pressure on some of the farms. Like, for example, what you just saw in the PUD request from uh, American Light and Energy, the reason why they're so interested in that particular site, it has a transmission line running right through the middle of it. It's, it was, it's prime they, he, for that. But if I understood it correctly, he wasn't planning on connecting to that transmission line. He's oh, yeah, he to is. I thought he was connecting to the yeah. three phase out on 197. So this is all I do mainly. So I'm just get a little bit uh, with my national grid hat on. Proximity, sure. yes, um, because the developer has to pay to connect. So that's on them. So if they want to go somewhere far, far away, they're going to pay a lot of money to hook into the grid. Um, 115s and higher are regulated by the New York State ISO. So no, they're not going to tap into a 115, but knowing that they can tap into a substation that then can draw the power to a higher transmission line is usually the draw. So that is right. why Moreau with multiple transmission lines in it, but it's, it's more the proximity to distribution than three right. phase. And then the other thing, Meredith, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's also not correct that this gets put in, the, the power gets put into the, the user on site or it's part of the local town electricity. It's not, it goes into the grid as an offset. Right. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's more what I'm not involved in. It, it does go into the collective grid. Um, you, you, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have a solar array in Moreau and the Moreau electric, electric bills then go down because we have a solar array here. That's not how that yeah. works. Not, no. It just goes into the grid as an offset um, and you still get your power from the grid. Yeah. There are those deals out there, too, that you see in the mail, um, NextAmp, where you can start buying your power from a solar provider. Um, yeah, but it's still, it, it's still a pass-through. It's, it's not, yeah. and that's another misnomer about when you get this individually at your house. You can't, it's a very expensive procedure to have the electricity you generate from your solar panel on your roof 
to be used in your house. You have to have batteries set up and all that. It's it just it's put back into the grid and you get the offset benefit in your bill. That, Jim, that's not, that's not necessarily what I understand, okay? I do know that there are a lot of farms. That's what I've been told. Well, I, I, there are a lot of farms out there that have on-site solar, okay? And they, their electricity does go to the grid, but they have a back feedback or whatever meter that basically judges how much electricity they're putting to the grid, and that comes off of their bill. I mean, they may not be using the electricity directly from the panels, but it is a direct offset to their particular use. Oh, I don't know if that would work. Awesome. But I don't know if that would work with a subdivision. I'm just saying for like a large user, for an industrial user, for a commercial building on our Route 9 corridor with panels on the roof, I'm pretty sure they can use the net metering for that, but I'm not positive. So, but these, I mean, that's not what's being proposed at Fox Run. That's a, that's two five megs at Fox Run. That's an electric generating facility. Um, that's a different, a different animal. I guess I have a question for Carla. Okay. If, if we go forward with this and we have a situation where open fire and the developer is putting these panels in and because I'm still putting them in, selling it to the, back to the grid, that then becomes a commercial operation and an agricultural link. Is yep. that even well, legal? Well, by this law, it would be because this makes it, this is allowed to be a use on the property. Because it's seen not as a commercial use, but more as a public utility. Well, should we leave it that way? What do you mean or if they leave it that way? Farmlands, farmland, and not uh, have a commercial, even though it's a utility. Somebody may get the use out of it. I don't like to see farmland gobbled up. Yeah. I agree. Okay. I, I, these are all great ideas. I don't, I'm not here to defend or um, no, no, I'm here to, no, no, yeah, to, to answer any questions. I mean, these are all good points. And I guess, uh, Carla. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, no, the only thing is that if somebody mentioned it's seen as a public utility. Usually the public utility um, designation goes to transmission lines, uh, gas lines, um, railroad tracks, public roads, that kind of thing. It, it doesn't necessarily go to an electrical generating facility, does it? It does in the town of Moreau. That's how you, that's okay. how the town has looked at allowing them. And the only way the town has allowed them in the industrial park and in the okay. industrial zone. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but that's how it's always been. Um, yeah, given, given how our ordinance is currently set yeah. up, um, there's a term in the uh, M zone, um, power transmission plan or something like that, power plant. And okay. these are viewed as power plants and that's where they're, um, that's why they're allowed there in the end zone. All right, but that, that makes sense. But I mean, as far as is allowing them, Why what we're now saying plants? is we're gonna allow manufacturing in the ag zone? Right. In the R5? That's why I'm sitting here listening to you folks. This is, this is what, right now, the answer is no. Right now, as the law that's before you says you, you cannot, if there's prime farmland, you cannot have um, solar. Now, if you have non-prime farmland, I guess that's the, the definition of it, um, then what's before you is you can have solar. One of the things I want to um, broach with you folks, too, is um, there has been a concept that Jim and I have discussed um, known as an overlay district. And that's something that the town board as of now did not want to put on the draft. Um, uh, but I wanted everyone to be aware of, you know, in lieu of, you know, saying you cannot have them in a certain district, the, the town then creates overlay districts and the overlay district is a little more flexible um, but that's something that's not before you, but it is a, a concept that has been uh, brought up and has been brought up by NYSERDA as well. 
So I, I just so wanted to reason, bring that to your attention. Carla, the, when- The reason why I like that is an overlay district, it, these, these are not been allowed as of right. An overlay district has to apply each and every time um, and it has to go through the town board to establish the district and then it has to come to this board for the site plan review to approve it or at least that's how I would recommend the procedure be established. So it's an extra layer of review each and every time a decision about you know a major power generating facility is decided upon and it's not so it's allowed like, as a right. So it's like a PUD then? Correct. A PUD is, a, is essentially a floating district. Yeah. So it can be, or the town can say the overlay district is, and they could draw circles and say, this is what the overlay district is. Okay. And then it wouldn't automatically always go to the town board. But this is, I mean, none of that's in the law you're looking at, but I wanted you to be aware of that. Carla, was any, was there any talk about, we keep talking about prime, farmland about the non-prime land in the town that could be suitable for these. I'm looking at the brownfield sites, Caputo, the landfill, the drag strip that are super fun sites. And that's very common. You're seeing some of these developments go there. There's a lot of other layers outside of town purview, but um, sometimes that's suitable. You have this land that can't be used. Um, that and are seeing solar. The, the dump on Weibel Avenue is one of them in Saratoga. Yes. Right. The way, Meredith, the way the town board reviewed it was um, district by district. Okay. So um, they, they decided um, in the draft to identify which districts solar would be allowed in and, and tier three solar, solar would be allowed in. Um, but again, that's one of the reasons that Jim and I were just talking about the overlay because that could encompass, there, there is areas in the town that have that capacity and the potential yeah. and the acreage for these things. So that yeah. is something that um, you know it, yeah. is out there. Yep. They are right next to um, KVs. And then also um, you wouldn't want to put a situation where like GE wants to come 10 years from now and do something with Caputo and they'd have to get a use variance and that right. nearly impossible. So I wouldn't want to get a situation where we, I, I get the zoning district application, but also at the same time, there are places that this is suitable in the town throughout because of its history. And yeah, this is Anne. I have the same kind of concerns that Meredith has. Um, you know, one thing I think is lacking in both the, the draft legislation and in the comprehensive plan is that there's no real expression about when and where, particularly the um, commercial operations of a solar plant would be desirable and prioritizing siting on unproductive or previously disturbed land like a landfill um, or and also emphasizing the, the need to minimize the impact on agriculture uh, in our, our area would be concepts that really need to be, I think, emphasized. Uh, and again, comp comprehensive plan probably has to be amended in order to, you know, provide that guidance as well. Um, I don't think when the comp plan was done, anyone contemplated solar power, or at least it wasn't mentioned. No, but I will say in the comprehensive plan and the farmland protection plan for the town, that farmland is considered a priority, all right? And yes. protecting that farmland was considered a priority. Now there is a lot of land in our R5 zone that is not valuable, historically valuable or prime farmland. So it's not to say that there's no place in the R5 for these solar generating facilities. Um, I just, every time I talk to a, one of the solar developers or one of the people in the town that are thinking about putting it in, they all argue that the best place for them to put it is on that flat, well-drained farmland they have. Um, and I just, that makes me really uncomfortable. And it is mentioned over and over again that these aren't a permanent use, they're temporary. And to some degree, they are, um, but most of them have 25-year contracts with at least three five-year extensions. We're talking 40 years. Um, I don't plan on being here 40 years from now. It's a couple of generations. So it's certainly in as much as it may not be a permanent use, it is not what I would consider a temporary use either. 
Yeah, I think once you take agricultural property out of agricultural use, the likelihood of it returning is probably quite small historically. So I had a couple other comments. I, I gave Carla a load of them, many of them uh, drafting clarifications and such, but I had a couple that were uh, maybe kind of overarching. Uh, it really has to do with the role of the planning board in the review of these projects, uh, particularly, well, actually, tier one, we're not involved. That's a building permit process. We are involved in the tier two and three. Um, and I presume that in tier two we're and three, we'd use the same site plan review process that we have currently in the, um, the code. Is that correct, Carla? That is correct. Um, just, okay. just so you know, um, one of the things that has been raised by NYSERDA is um, that perhaps you guys only look at the tier three and not the tier two, but that hasn't, you know, that's just one of their comments. Because yeah, it, and the tier two could be more administrative. Yeah, well, both, both of them are, at least in the current draft, are set up such that it seems like the only... Uh, only review that the, the planning board conducts is perhaps seeker and maybe some screening. Otherwise, it looks like all aspects, all requirements of those types of projects are set out. For tier three? Yeah. It's, pretty, it's well, a pretty lengthy list of, you know, if all these things are provided, or it's almost as if we have a, a checklist and we go check that's been provided, check decommissioning plan, you know, and so on. Uh, well, if, all if you look at uh, Section C at 149-99C, you do have site plan review standards. So but, but site plan review would be determining that setbacks and such are met? Um, that's what it has in there, that they'll adhere to heightened setback requirements of the underlying zoning district. Right, so anybody could figure that out. But what if, what if we sense that, oh, gee, this is just the wrong place. It may be an appropriate or a district where it's permitted, and it may be that it can meet these setback requirements, but it's really horrible. It's not a well, good idea. Well, just like with every, just like with every um, application and not, not liking the placement of it, you, you need to have an actual, and as you know, a legal basis to deny it if it meets what's in here. Um, just because the board is not comfortable with, you know, where it's located, if it meets the requirements, um, then it should go forward. But I mean, to your point, that's exactly why we're talking to you. I mean, these are things that the town board would not have thought of because they don't do what you folks do. Again, the way, the way I read this is that we go down the list, we determine the height, setback, light, lot size, and so on, which are fairly easy to calculate. Uh, are done, and then we're left with screening. Maybe you know what kind of berms, um, yep. not whether or not, not it's desirable, and roads. Visual impact is there. Visual impact. Yep. Visual impact is going to be the big. Yeah. Well, I think I too. Out. Then maybe it gets back to the the concern about how the comprehensive plan is written and where these types of projects are considered desirable. And manufacturing industrial makes sense, but then we have R5 for a tier three. Yeah, I'll, I'm gonna speak up and, you know, as you guys know, I work for one of the companies um, uh, proposing one of the sites. So, you know, you can take that as it, as it lies. Um, the, the argument against solar and manufacturing and industrial is that it doesn't create the jobs that are desired by the M1 or, you know, those commercial districts. It's uh, so usually it's it gets um, gets a sideways look there because it doesn't it doesn't fit the you know, it fits the the definition if you look at industrial or commercial, but it doesn't fit the economic reasoning for those districts you know and that was one of the one of the um points made when there was a solar development that was presented i don't know maybe two or three years ago for the industrial park off bluebird and, and that was one of the considerations that you're using up acreage you know in something that's zoned for 
you know, perhaps a more uh, job intensive use. Um, you know, just speaking to that one. And, you know, it's, you know, it's tricky because, you know, for the, for the, the, the sites that would be presented under tier three, they are very limited, as Meredith said, to transmission lines. And, you know, this is where perhaps, as Carla mentioned, an overlay district may be the best bet. Um, because it's not, it's not, um, you know, uh, it's not going to run rampant because the infrastructure is not there. You know, it, it's all about the transmission lines. And I'm not, you know, I, I don't work on this stuff. I know about it because my company is doing it. Um, you know, I, I'm on the river, so I'm a hydroelectric guy. But it's, um, you know, it's, it is, it is constrained by the infrastructure that's in place. And you're not going to, no one's going to change that. Um, you know, you can't build new transmission lines. Not really. You know, so you're. Hey, hey Carla. Carla. You know, yes. it might be a, a, a reasonable request to make, particularly with our supervisor's newfound power at the county, um, is to request that GIS exercise be done. Yeah, and, I, I, I was and going map, to and, and map all the sites in Moreau on a predetermined basis that meet the qualification standard for proximity to a substation or a transmission line. And you're gonna know right up front to the acre what envelope, what building envelope you're dealing with in the town. And you know, Jim, I and where it's located. And I, I can that, I can do that. I can ask um, if we can yeah. do that. Reach out to Jim. Yeah. I if you can do that, Carla, and then add layers for the um, you know for the prime soil classifications, and then you know also ex you know, yeah. and then while we're at it. Take a look in high levels <coughs> in your steep slopes, you know, areas that are not buildable for anything. I can ask them to do that. I, yes. I yeah, I don't know if <laughs> they may turn around to me and say, yeah, no, we're too busy. But it's yeah, not hard exercise. Well, within a couple of days, they could get there and you can get down to the acreage, what the net result is, where it's located, and what lots are involved. But can I ask a question, please, just for clarification? We keep talking about transmission lines. Um, and I think somebody told me earlier that phase three isn't what they're tying into. What transmission lines are these particular facilities looking for? If it's, if it's utility scale, then you're looking probably at, you know, when I say utility scale um, in the megawatt size, you're usually looking at, you know, 34, five or 115 KV. Okay, so that's high voltage. That's not three phase. Well, it, it, it is three phase, but it's three phase high voltage. It's not. It's um. It's not distribution voltages. Okay. The reason I'm asking is it's. It seems to be listed. That's some kind of a limitation. But the the dozens of people that have pulled in my yard trying to get 40 acres of my land for solar panels have said that they can hook right up to the power lines on Fortsville Road. That's why they're in my yard. Now, that, that means it's a county highway, and that's a pretty standard power feed. That's not a, wow, it's going to be hard to find those lines kind of situation. So, yeah, I would agree. It would be kind of nice to know where they're looking at and what's, mm -hmm. you know, potential build out for something like this. Right. You know, yeah, I will do that. I'll see what I can do. Uh -oh. I have one further question for Carla. Clarification, actually. Sure. Under our site plan review standards, they're listing a particular lot coverage. Are we, in this instance, referring to solar panels only or solar panels plus other infrastructure that uh, would be considered as part of lot coverage? My understanding is it's the panels. Just the panels. That's my understanding. I think that's correct. And perhaps we should clarify that. Make a panel with lot coverage and whatever. For some clown like me, says, we've got these buildings over here, so you got to deduct that. Okay. Carla, 
could you explain a little bit about how the um, pilot agreements would work, particularly in agricultural districts? I do understand that if this law is adopted, that uh, the town will have the option of entering into a pilot agreement uh, that would uh, reduce the amount of tax that the landowner has to pay. And I'm curious as to how that actually works uh, insofar as it, it would appear that the panels or the arrays are actually personal property. And so, does so this is, go ahead, so, I'm sorry. So you know, I just, you, if, if you could explain just how that works. Sure, um, absolutely. This is an ever-changing area of the law. And within the last few months, there was a case that came down talking about this. Um, but the way, the way the current real property tax law is written is the towns have the option. The way the town of Moreau code is going to be written is it's not an option that the town is requiring them to get the pilot, um, to enter into a pilot agreement. So the way um, the courts have held that, especially in agricultural land, um, the land itself, for example, if I own the land, and I get an ag exemption on it, but then, and you come in and you own, and you put on, um, this is like, you're a different company and you come in and you put on the panels. The ag exemption is reduced on the amount of area that the, the um, panels would be. And then those panels would be taxable, so to speak. So the way folks are dealing with that now is to just say, we are going to require a pilot agreement and um, the folks that own the solar panels have to pay the taxes, you know, the payment in lieu of taxes for them to be in the area. Uh, that being said, there is a um, proposed or, or recommended calculation that NYSERDA puts out that says how much each taxing uh, jurisdiction can get uh, from, for example, National Grid. If it's national, you know, they're going into national grids. Um, generally speaking in this area with the national grid, it's about, I wanna say it's either 3,500, I think it's about 3,500 or 5,000 per megawatt, I believe. Um, don't quote I think me in Glenville, we just passed, the, we just passed that, we just passed this provision in our law. We got 7,500 bucks. Yeah, you're jumping ahead of me there, Jim. Um, so, but what I'm saying is there's a recommended um, calculation. Um, and, and to your point, you put this in one of your respond, one of your comments uh, to me. That's all of the taxing jurisdictions combined. But the ta but so county, uh, town, school district, all three are going to require a pilot in the town of Moreau. All three would be capped at a certain amount if we went with nicer to calculation. But as Jim indicated, we're not required to. So it's really a discussion that the town board is going to have to identify the amount um, that they're going to require. So the town, the, the town has the option to require a full assessment, doesn't it? Well, because it's a pilot, we have the option. To, we're, we're not going to do the full set. We're going to um, put down whatever the town board wants. They haven't discussed the number yet. They just wanted, and working with the assessor's office, um, they wanted this implemented into the law right now. But it would be, that, but they're contemplating then something less than full assessment. They may or may not be. They haven't discussed the number yet. Okay. But if the they don't have, would... if they don't have a pilot, it would be full assessment. Well, no, because they're exempt. Under they're, the, agri they're, the, at the land the land will be exempt. So the ag exemption, you know, would be there on the land. And then the area on the land that the um, panels are on, um, the courts are back and forth on to whether or not they are exempt. The ag, so the exemption, the ag exemption is only for active farmland. I understood. Understood. But we're presuming that the rest of the farmland is actually being actively farmed. Okay, but the, where the solar panels are is not actively farmed. Right, so that would not be part of the, okay. that's why I'm saying the ag exemption will be reduced. Okay, all right. 
but then I just want to make the, sure I understood you. The, yep. the array, the array is going to be taxed as a solar power operation. Correct. And you're saying it, we would enter into a pilot agreement, but I, I thought the pilot agreement was something you could um, provide or not provide for in the legislation. And if it is, not, it, it is in the, in the state legislation. However, towns are given the option to incorporate in their town code under home rule that we are requiring it. Yeah, and I'm just wondering why. Um, well, because it's, it benefits the town um, to do that, uh, because there is, you know, each year these, the folks are going to bring Article 7 cases uh, claiming that they should be exempt, uh, claiming that they, because the law is all over the place, they're going to say, no, we should be exempt, therefore, um, or we should be not, we should not be assessed as high and the town would have to go through the litigation for all of that. Um, so one of the things that many assessors across the state are doing is requiring pilots because that gives some certainty to not only the town, but it gives certainty to the solar companies as well. They know how much they're going to have to pay over the next, X, you know, the term of the pilot. <coughs> So the pilot then takes into consideration the change of use of the land. Correct. So it's no longer designated as active farmland ag exemption. That area is not. A pilot is in lieu of taxes. So this is like a separate agreement we would have with them. They would have well, to that's pay. That's what I'm asking is, is, is that land still listed as active farmland, <clears throat> even though you're getting a pilot payment for the use or is it changing the designation of the ag exemption completely as far as where the panels are? That's a question for the assessor, how she clarifies, okay. how she quantifies that. Okay, all right. Hmm. But the pilot applied in tier two as well? Tier three only. Okay, so if a farmer puts a, a tier two system up to provide 110% of the farmer's requirements, then their tax exemption is not going to be affected. Correct. Right, as it's written now, it's tier three only. And that's how and it think, is in most areas. Yeah, and I think, I think that makes sense because if they're putting up a solar array for their own agricultural purposes, that's probably considered an agricultural use it, it is. is covered by ag and markets. Yeah. I mean, the same okay. thing with if I wanted to put a solar or a windmill here at the farm, as long as the windmill doesn't generate more than 110% of my use, there's it's really all covered under ag and markets. Um, the even, you know, height limitations and everything else, the windmill is considered an ag structure because it's producing electricity for the ag production. Mm -hmm. So the same would go with the solar panels, I would assume. Correct. Under the amendment and decommissioning, who, who reports out whether or not they are functioning properly or generating electricity? That's actually something that was brought up by NYSERDA as well. So that's something that we have to look at um, as to how it would be, you know, how the decommissioning plan would ascertain because you don't want the town to go down and do, you know, how, how's the town going to go and enforce that? So that's something that does need to be discussed. I don't have an answer for you. That's something that, that needs to be discussed. Uh, the other question I've got is on the 4,000 square foot coverage limitation for the solar panels in tier two. I was wondering where that came from. It didn't seem to uh, relate to anything. Honestly, I do not know. Like I said, this was this went over. There's a lot of uh, cooks in the kitchen. Oh yeah, no, I know. I mean, it, the, basically, the four thousand square feet comes from the definition of a tier two system, which establishes a cap of the four thousand square feet of the solar panel surface area, not lot coverage. So it's a little different there, and that's something that I was working with NYSERDA on. So the 4,000 square feet is really the solar panel surface, the area of the solar panels. 
the surface, not the lot coverage area. And a question regarding building integrated systems. Mm -hmm. I would think that they would just be general building permit material, not even considered a tier one. Under the model law, they're considered, considered tier one. So that's why they were incorporated in the town law. But I mean, it, I'm, taking your, I'm taking all the points down. So okay. we can go back no, to the That's a board. question I... But tier one is considered on-site use though, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I guess I, I had the same question about the 4,000 square foot because if a, if a facility in, our, in a zone that allows for a tier one setup can use more than 4,000 square feet of solar panels on site, why would we limit that? Well, the 4,000 is a tier two. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My mistake. That's okay. Yeah, and it's a, it's a lot of panels. <laughs> it is, yeah. It's almost 230 panels. And a typical house would use 14 to 36. Or any further questions for Carl or comments? I guess the only comment Again, I would see. Oh, go ahead. If people have individual comments, you can e email me and we can, I'll make sure we pass around to both the town board and the zoning board. Is Carla going to distribute our notes from tonight too, or should we still follow up? I have handwritten notes and I think I can read them. Um, and I think Jim was probably taking notes as well. So we, okay. so we can all, you know, I will put together a summary of everything that I put down. Um, I think Jim will do the same. He did that with the ZBA. I don't want to tell Jim what to do, but um, I thought that was helpful. No, that's fine. Yeah, I'll do the same here. And again, if, if, I, if I didn't capture your comment correctly or, yep. or was too short, certainly embellish or provide further detail, and I'll make sure that gets passed around to everybody. Thanks. So everybody knows kind of, um, yeah, I know there are some attendees on that have a particular interest in these. Um, the, at, the next step really would be kind of putting all of these together and compiling everything and then going back to the town board and saying, okay, these are all the comments that we've received from NYSERDA and the planning and the zoning board. Um, you know, let's hash this out, let's get a working draft, and then we can go out to the public. Um, and, you know, with any luck, uh, when we do that, we'll actually, you know, maybe we'll be able to, to see some members of the public um, in lieu of having a, a full Zoom meeting. But at this point, that's kind of where we are at this. I, I don't want to say that we are definitely doing that or that there's any kind of, um, you know, public hearing or anything scheduled as of yet. So, I just want everybody to be aware, especially the attendees online, that at this point, um, we will compile everyone's comments and um, bring it back to the town board. And then um, the town board can look at that and you know, decide what they wanna do. Very good, Carl, thank you. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Board. Anything further? I have one item before we go. And we have coming out, as you may well be aware, a public hearing for a solar farm. In our deliberations, we have concentrated on whether we feel that this application meets the requirements of the PUD. I would urge everyone before the next meeting to think about what other things should we be considering in this PUD application. Don't have tunnel vision for is it legal or not because the legality of it uh, really is not up to us. So think of everything that you may want to uh, question uh, as, you, as we go into our deliberations. 
Through the fifteenth, right? That's on to the uh, April nineteenth for a public hearing. Yeah. So that's going to be a lengthy public hearing. Oh, yeah. So we don't schedule anything else that night. Well, that's up to you guys, so, but yeah, that's going to. You, I, that's, about that now, you folks have that. three other public hearings scheduled for April nineteenth. I thought yeah, you scheduled a couple tonight. Yeah, but one of them's not very controversial. That'll be a, you know crickets in the background kind of one so two of them could attract a lot of attention uh, arrowhead oh, could attract a lot of attention and i think certainly the pud request will as well yes so my question is do we schedule anything else for that night or do we go back to having the two meetings again well you schedule a public hearing we can't change that correct but well, actually, like, like, for example, next week's not too bad. I think there's, if memory serves, I think there's two items on the agenda. Next week's is not, the regular March meeting is not bad, but April's already got at least three items. Well, I guess my question is, we schedule one for April. Why are we here now? Can you study that? That's I, enough. I guess the question really, come on, I'm going to jump on you a minute, Mike. We might lose it. Is it appropriate or allowed for us to limit during a public hearing individuals' comments to a certain amount of time? Yes. The, the organizational meeting um, limits comments in public hearing to five minutes per individual. That's incredibly reasonable. And I think you also have a, a opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to hold off on second time commenters until everybody's heard at least once. And how many times can they comment? Is it just twice? As so many times as you want them to. As many times as they want to. As many times as you want them to, but there are, are ways that um, public hearings are held and especially in the Zoom era, so to speak, um, there are ways that I can work with you to make sure we have this all set um, so that everyone is can speak, but everyone is not um, repeating everyone else's comments. Okay. Can we also say that it has to be application based, just so somebody doesn't want to get up and talk about climate change and renewables and the broader picture? <laughs> so what I'm saying is, Jim, is there anything else coming in for the April 19th meeting? There, there's another PUD lurking out there in the shadows, but it won't make it until, it won't make it to this board until May at the earliest, I would suspect. Yes. Well, so that we're not here at 11, 11 o'clock. And I don't know of anything else. Um, you know? uh, there's gonna be some, I think, substantial reconstructions of a couple of properties on Route 9, you know, I think that are probably a result of the sewer. So, yeah. but we have permission to hold the meetings a month if necessary. We have, we have to. Move. So, Mike, Mike, would you like Jim to contact us if something else comes up to see if we would like to split it into two meetings? Or, I, you know, John, I do. I think that's important because I, I, I find myself here much after ten o'clock at night. Not, you know, after working all day. Well, that being here until the eleven o'clock hour, right? I think that's unreasonable to be doing conducting business. I just. Well, that, that, okay. that's what we did that resulted in this meeting. You know, I, yeah. we, had a, we had eight applications come in and yeah. some of them by the nature of the applicant was com complex and, yeah. you know, uh, lengthy. So we tried to balance the two meetings out and I think it worked out pretty well. I mean, I know it's late now, but yeah. it's, it's, there were about the same amount of substance with each, yeah. each meeting. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. Yes, I'm I would say. Anything. Well, I'm going to say, Mike, if that's if that's what you're asking, Mike, then I'm going to agree with you. That Jim should get a hold of us if there's more stuff that shows up, and uh, see how we feel about it, and if we want to split it into two meetings. Very good. Thank you. All right, I'll keep an eye on it and uh, notify you accordingly. Perfect. Thank you. Jim. Thank you, Jim. No problem. Okay. Or anything further. Mr. Martin, do you have anything for us? 
Nope, I'm all set. All set. If that's the case, we'll entertain a motion. Motion to or to, yeah, motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to been made. It's adjourned. Second. Second. Mike, motion yep. is made and second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Good night, Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Aye. Good night. Good night. So, Jim, are we on? Are we on? Hold on. <laughs> I just want to know how much money you lost. No knock. No knocks on the door.